Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we do anything else, can you please uh, just make sure that you can hear me OK, you can see my screen. So please just type yes on the YouTube chat. Just so I know that you can hear me OK. OK, so a couple of yeses. Just give it a five my OK, great. So everybody can hear me. That's brilliant. OK. <laughs> so welcome. Good morning. I know that this is, the for most of you, the first day of the half term. So thank you so much for still doing another morning of work, in a way. But this is going to be fun work. We're going to have really great speakers talking to you today about the curriculum. And I'm sure it's going to be an excellent morning. You're going to learn a lot and you're going to have the chance to talk to other hundreds of people who are live here today with us. So before we start, just a few, uh, just a very quick introduction about us who is organizing this webinar and also how the conference is going to work particularly. So how you can interact, how you can ask, ask questions and how you can take the conversation over to Twitter as well. All right, so first things first, uh, my name is Flavia. I don't know if you already know me, if you've already talked to me in the past, but my name is Flavia. I am the chief scientist at Seneca Learning. I've been with Seneca since 2017. So if you have used Seneca, you probably have talked to me at some point. So, and I'm basically organizing all the CPD that we offer at Seneca. So if you, do know Seneca. If you don't know Seneca, that's just a very quick overview of what we do. So currently we have an online learning platform with courses all the way from primary to A level. They're all exam board specific. They're all written by senior examiners. They're all amazing. And uh, they're all based on neuroscience. So they're all based on cognitive science, how the brain works, how memory works, how learning works. And that's why they are effective. So we have academic scientific proof that they work. They have, those proof have been published on academic papers and it really works to improve your students' achievement. It's all interactive, it's all fun, it's all gamified. And we have at the moment more than 6 million people using Seneca, which is pretty cool. So this is for if you don't know Seneca yet. If you do know, then let me show you some news. So this year we started offering some extra things. So we have, for example, MIS integration. So you can now connect Seneca to your school system. And that means that everything that you have in your school is going to be synced with Seneca. So you don't have to create your classes uh, individually. You don't have to add students individually. Everything, the moment that you log into Seneca, all of your classes, all of your students, all of your courses, everything will be there already. So it makes everything much easier. You can manage your students. You can move them from class to class. It's just a lot easier. And we also have a lot of new features for senior and middle leadership team. So we have uh, a whole department report, a whole school report. So ways that you can follow your whole school uh, in real time. So you, in the click of a button, you can see exactly what's going on with your whole school. So these are a few things that we have been investing now. So we always had the teacher platform where you can set assignments and receive the grades in real time automatically. So it's also saves you some time as well. It's pretty great for formative assessment, for diagnosing misconceptions, because you get to see how your students are progressing. But now this year, we're trying to focus a lot on the higher level uh, view. So you get to see your whole department, your whole school at the same time. So if you want to know more about this news, so if you are a member of a head of department, head of year, head teacher, assistant head teacher, etc please get in touch with me and I can show you more about those new features that we have exciting for, especially for you. So let me put my email here in the chat. And please, uh, yeah, just drop me an email. There I am. And I'll be happy to walk you through all the news and help you get started with all of those things. All right, so uh, now let's just give you an introduction about how things are going to work so we can make the most out of this conference. So as you know, everything is happening on YouTube, obviously. So you will be using the chat to comment and uh, ask your questions. So I'm just going to share this. So this is our 
Let's see. Okay. So it's going to see a bit of things, but this is your YouTube here. So you get to see here. Please type your questions here whenever you want. So just type a question, hit enter, and we will be answering them. So make sure that you type all your questions, all your comments. So they have to be questions. If you see something that one of the speakers is talking about that resonates with you, that you have tried in your class or in your school, comment on the chat and then the other people can comment as well. So that's the idea here. So type your questions in the chat and I can see the chat and I'll make sure that your, our speakers answer all of those questions. The more questions, the better, the more interactive, the better. We cannot see each other today, you know, in person. So if you use the chat, then we can make this really, really interactive, really engaging and just better learning for everybody involved. So do use your chat, do comment and ask questions. And on top of using the chat for, you know, real time interaction, we uh, take everything to Twitter. So there will be a bar on the bottom with the handle of each speaker as they speak. And we are using the hashtag SenecaCPG. Everything. So uh, feel free to. This is us. So we are at Seneca Learn, but you have the on the bar. So you now take screenshots of the slides, add your comments and share, tag us, do the hashtag, and then more people can interact, more people can get to know what we're talking about here. And then again, that just increases learning. You know, when we share things with other people, that's when we learn even more. All right. So uh, I think that's it. So our first speaker is Alex Fairlamb. So she's already here. Hi, Alex. Morning. I remember to unmute, so it's a successful morning so far. <laughs> Great. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. So just so you know, uh, final thing, we're going to have Alex Farlam first, then Alex Gordon, then we're going to have a 10-minute break, then we're going to have Zoe answer, and then Lekha Sharma in the end. Okay, so you know that. But stay for everybody because all of them are incredible. So now I'm going to go away and let Alex start her presentation. See you later. OK, good morning. So I'm going to try and um, share my screen. Hopefully this will be successful. Um, so all fingers crossed for me. <clears throat> OK, so um, I'm talking today about diversity within the curriculum. Um, by no means at all am I an expert. So this is just me sharing kind of like the journey that I've gone on in terms of how I'm trying to make sure that I've got diversity within the curriculum in a blended, not binary way. So it's not kind of like a bolt on to a curriculum that actually it's threaded through to make sure that it's diverse and it's representative of the communities that we serve. So I'm Alex Fairlam, I'm an assistant head teacher, of teaching and learning, and I'm also a TM History Icons lead coordinator as well, and a proud member of the Historical Association Secondary Committee. Um, and as you can tell, I'm an absolute proud feminist and champion of diversity as well. So quite often when I show this image um, in kind of face-to-face -face kind of conferences. Oh, I can't wait till they're back. But quite often I'll show this image and it'll be kind of like a question, which is, you know, what are these women doing in medieval England? And if you think back to your studies of history, like all those days back when sort of thing, your kind of existing schema and kind of the curriculum that you will have studied would have been that women were queens, women did midwifery, women did kind of like sewing and all that sort of thing. And that was the curriculum that we were given. So therefore, why would we know any different? But actually, when you remove it, this is women doing building. This is women involved in architecture. And this probably wasn't included in the curriculum that you had because it would have been about kings and kingship, 1066, Henry VIII, all that sort of thing. And so the voice of women was either lost or it was represented in a way which reinforced gender stereotypes and didn't give the full breadth of the experience of women at that time. And also people of colour, people of different disabilities as well. So my kind of hope is that I kind of bring to life different narratives and stories which help to show a more diverse and accurate, therefore, representation of the past, but also within other subjects as well. Obviously, I'm a historian, but I'll be talking about other subjects as well and how it is that you can ensure diversity and representation. 
So just to give you a little bit of background behind there, um, you know, your existing schema and kind of knowledge of women in medieval England would have been kind of, you know, sewing babies, that sort of thing, being the dutiful wife. But actually women had a lot of power. So if we look at the Anglo-Saxon times before the Normans came, they actually had a lot of agency. And, you know, we have things like St. Hilda of Whitby. Um, we've got kind of a power in terms of the religious power that they're able to wield. We've got financial independence. We've got the fact that they could actually divorce. Um, um, and then when we think about kind of like 50s and 60s Britain, how divorce was kind of frowned upon, you can see how the position of women has changed over time. And therefore, we have this inaccurate um, kind of myth going around about women that until kind of like the 1970s with the Divorce Reform Act and kind of like, you know, equal pay act that women didn't have any power at all in the past, apart from Boudicca and, and Elizabeth Tudor. And that's just not the case. What we have is we have times where women had agency that changed and then they were able to develop agency in different ways within constraints. And so that's why we need to make sure that we look at kind of the curriculum and make sure that we're giving an accurate and representative um, image of kind of our subject that we serve and our kind of disciplines as well. So obviously there was a lot of kind of light that was shone on the need for diversity within the curriculum um, when it is that we've had um, events over the past kind of two years. Um, and so there has been a greater kind of focus on ensuring um, that there is diversity woven through your curriculum. But I know many of us will have been working on it, you know, since day dot um, in terms of championing the changes that we want to see. And so for me, I always think what I want to achieve is the curriculum in my school is diverse and it represents the communities that we serve, that broad range of uh, people within our communities to make sure that we ensure the children have a global understanding of the world and they explore and study differing perspectives and experiences in meaningful ways. And that's got to be kind of the key focus of when we're looking at diversity within the curriculum. So an amazing book that you can read is one by Carolina Creda Perez. And it talks about some of the issues that we see. Obviously, this is looking at through the lens of gender. And I'll be touching upon kind of issues of kind of race um, later on. Um, not that the two are kind of distinct, but obviously just looking at these kind of um, the issues that Carolina puts forward in this. So what we've got is that basically in the past, we have this existence of invisible women and there seems to be a data gap. And when we look at how she argues it, it's because basically, you know, women are kind of grouped together in one kind of thing. It doesn't actually look at kind of women of color, disabled women. Women are just grouped as one homogenous thing. And therefore, it just gives us this one lens of the female perspective rather than the variety of different perspectives that many different women have. And quite often when we look at things, it's quite often the middle and upper class representation of women, which is shown within curriculums. And actually, we need to make sure that we're looking at kind of how working class women and women of color, disabled women are represented within it as well. And making sure that when we're creating our curriculums, that we're not reinforcing this kind of this myth that there are jobs for boys and jobs for girls. Um, because what we've got is the generic masculine is used when we're talking about kind of certain professions which are male dominated. So you might kind of talk about an astronaut and then the pronoun of he and him just naturally kind of flows out in conversation. And actually it should be they in terms of making sure that we're representing men, women, non-binary um, and making sure that everyone feels included. And in that actually it's, it's not a job for girls, not a job for boys. It's a job for everyone as well. And that we're making sure that when we're talking about careers and STEM, et cetera, that we're not using the generic masculine, that we're making sure that we are very careful with the language that we choose when speaking to our children. So what we've got is we've got this kind of issue within the curriculum and it identifies two different ones within this book. The first one is looking at kind of science and history. So the fact that within science and history, quite often when you study things like the history of medicine, it'll be that it's kind of dominated by white male scientists. Um, that you will kind of study kind of through the lens of kind of these different people who are able to achieve these wonderful things like Einstein and Newton. But actually, where are the women? Where are the people of colour within this curriculum? The massive achievements that they have made and how much they've contributed to it. And then quite often when we look at stories or narratives, which kind of look at different scientists, it'll be that the role of, of women and people of colour are actually diminished within it. And an example is DNA, where it is that quite often Rosalind Franklin is kind of muted within a story or diminished to kind of like a one line narrative. 
And it needs to be that we make sure that that doesn't happen, that we are not excluding women and that we're making sure that actually we are looking at the full range and it's not male biased. And again, we've got an example here within music where Jess McCabe noticed that with 63 sets of work within a British A-level um, kind of curriculum at Excel, not a single one was by a woman. That's 63 sets of work and not one piece was by a woman in 2015. And if we look at it, as um, Caroline writes, given that female composers were not prominent in the Western classical tradition in that canon, they wrote that there would be very few female composers that could be included. Now, what has happened is obviously in that time frame, it was that it was very difficult for female composers to be recognised, to be able to play within public spheres, to not have their work diminished. Um, to not kind of be able to champion. But what we've done is we've taken that kind of that, that mentality and we've carried it on and said, well, these are the greats of that time, therefore. Whereas actually we're in a new era. And what we need to do is we need to look and say, look, those were the ones which were able to rise to prominence. But actually, here are a range of different composers um, who wrote music, who performed. And actually, let's have a look at that broad range, but then also look at why it is that they weren't able to achieve the same level of kind of notoriety or kind of fame as the others. And look at those constructs and maybe look at our common kind of frameworks and how it is that certain people of colour and, and kind of women aren't able to perhaps achieve the same opportunities as kind of um, men and that sort of thing. So actually... What we look at in, in the International Encyclopedia of Women Composers, there's 6,000 entries. So what we've got is this canon that we have created. And don't forget, we are architects of the curriculum. We are the ones who at Key Stage 3 get to choose what our curriculum looks like, obviously with guidance from the national curriculum. So it's about how we take a look at that and we, as the architects, make sure that from the domain of knowledge that makes up our discipline, that we're selecting the most broad and representative stories to make sure that we have got those different perspectives and how when we do come across greater constraints with exam specifications, we can still seek to broaden what that specification is and thread in other opportunities, but also champion and challenge those exam boards, um, champion, sorry, diversity and challenge those exam boards and say, you know, We've moved on. Actually, can we look at this again and make sure that it's representative of the communities that we serve? And what we've actually got is, you know, we've got people like um, Elizabeth McConey, who's not being involved. We've got Handel's sister actually wrote a lot of the music, which he then used under his own name. So, you know, she wasn't given that opportunity. And those stories, those narratives need to come out. So what we've got is, and I can't recommend this book um, more, is this kind of idea of kind of, well, how is it that we've come up with a curriculum that where it is that it seems to be dead white men who are the main focus of it. And we've got this within music, as we've identified, but we've also got this within history as well. So we've got David Starkey, who's pretty much not only kind of um, championing this idea that, you know, it's that women shouldn't be as representative and that sort of thing, but also female historians who are being quite derogatory towards female historians. So what we need to make sure is that when we are creating our curriculum, that we make sure that we're not reinforcing gender bias and unconscious bias. We need to make sure that teachers are aware that they may have a bias without realising it. And it's key that they reflect before engaging on curriculum design and development. And there's a really good book by, um, called Boys Don't Try. And within that, it's got an unconscious bias in terms of gender kind of survey that you can look to see if, you know, perhaps it is that you have got a bias. And I think it's really, really important that we look at that and we realise that actually when it is in the day, um, in the days a few years ago, when Michael Gove should have um, changed the curriculum, um, it is that, you know, that narrowed it. And we've now got the opportunity to broaden it and make sure it's the curriculum that we want our children to study. So I'm just going to move on briefly over this because I've talked about, about this a lot, but it's the use of language as well. And within um, modern foreign languages as well, what we've got is quite often within some languages, there is the kind of generic male for the, 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 the larger group of people. So quite often when you're talking about they, it's with the gender masculine. Um, and I know that within certain languages, there are attempts to use kind of more um, kind of um, gender neutral pronouns and stuff like that. So what we've got is within languages, maybe looking at, you know, how it is that you can ensure that those kind of gender neutral new pronouns, that language about why there is generic masculine for when talking about a group of people. So it's really interesting to kind of bring that argument to light and kind of talk to them about that. And then again, when it is that you're kind of studying sources, when you're studying poetry, looking at gender inflicted languages and the delivery of language as well. 
Um, and just making sure that, again, when we're talking to the children, that we are using pronouns which are representative of the collective mass of the body. So how do we then avoid lenses of absolute truth? So what we know is that basically um, what has happened in the past is a certain lens has been presented and that's been kind of almost kind of said to be the absolute truth. So quite often this perspective is an absolute truth. So this idea that this is how I see it, therefore that is the truth. And quite often that's come from the male lens, the male dominated lens. And that's not the absolute truth. In the end, we see the truth how we see the truth. And we've been looking at it through one truth. So how do we avoid that and make sure that we have got lenses, almost like a kaleidoscope, where it is that we actually make sure that we are seeing things from a representative broad strata. So what we can see is um, this was kind of Simone de Beauvier who said that actually, you know, there is an absolute truth. The way that he saw the world was universal while feminism sees it from a female perspective and that's niche. So what she's arguing is basically there has been this kind of this lens and then when a woman comes along and talks about it from a woman's perspective or a person of colour comes along and talks about it from a person of colour's perspective, it's seen as niche, not the norm, not what the bulk of people experience and therefore it's almost kind of dismissed and what we need to do is avoid that absolute truth lens and say, actually, there are a range of different truths, depending on the person who's experienced it. And let's hear that perspective and let's talk about that perspective. So um, I'm just going to move on. And what we just need to make sure is that we are ensuring that when we're looking at kind of issues that we are looking at diverse history rather than separation history. So when it is that you are looking at your curriculum, that you're not kind of like bolting it on that sort of thing so if you've got a scheme of learning and you're looking at music and you're looking at kind of like jazz or something like that that you don't kind of bolt on on the end of your scheme of learning women in jazz that that's just kind of bolting it on and that reinforces separation history here are a group of people doing jazz and here are women and that's not how it should be instead it should be diverse history and that actually it should be woven it should be coexisting but still celebrating why it is that um, they have different narratives and experiences. So within this, it's about kind of thinking, how can I blend within my curriculum this diverse kind of strata of experiences and not make it a bolt-on activity? And that's why my talk is called Blended, Not Binary. So making sure that it's not tickless tokenism, where it is that you're like, right, OK, I've got women in there. I've got, you know, um, I've got kind of people of colour in there. I've got children's kind of stories in there and that sort of thing. It's not a tick list thing. It's about looking at a topic and thinking, have I covered a broad range of experiences and narratives within that? But also making sure that you're not over blending it so that those experiences are nuanced or lost because we do know there are different experiences and that's how it comes about in the conversation. Because what we can therefore do if we don't do that is an inaccurate understanding of the past, but also our discipline. And what we can do is we can accidentally reinforce prior misconceptions inaccuracy about women and BAME can be reinforced, it can reinforce unconscious bias um, and it undermines that um, Britain is a part of the world and not the centre of it and that can sometimes be the issue within curriculums that we overly focus on Britain, we aren't the centre of the world, we are a part of it so how to make sure that our curriculums are global and represent the multicultural nature of Britain as well. And within this, this is also an opportunity for us to champion anti-racist teaching and education. So to challenge racism, racism and challenge misogyny in all of its forms. We do know that those are current issues throughout education. There is racism, there is misogyny. And unless, you know, we face this kind of truth um, and look at it honestly and kind of think collectively, how can we make sure that the curriculum is geared to to confront these issues and empower students with um, information to help tackle those issues, then, you know, I think that's something that we really do need to focus on. Um, so we've got an example here where this is actually taken from history. And this isn't just kind of me getting on a soapbox or a collection of people kind of saying, we need diversity and other people saying, well, that's you with your kind of, your kind of, um, you know, you've got a certain agenda that you're trying to kind of force. Well, actually look at it from the voice of the children. We've actually got children saying there should be more focus on individuals in science and in English in terms of women, because you only hear about men. It should be put in equally alongside men. It should not be separate. If you're teaching about it just because they're women, you are enforcing, reinforcing the separation from male history, which isn't what you want to do. You want to integrate it together. 
And you should focus on women throughout the whole of history, not just specific things like the suffragettes. And hands up before, you know, I kind of really started working on the curriculum when I first started my career. If I look back, you know, there's Elizabeth Tudor and then there's the suffragettes and there's Margaret Thatcher. And as a woman in the North, that just makes me die inside that that's kind of a factor in there anyway. But, you know, where were women all of that time? Like, did they just not exist or were they just in the home sewing and cooking? Where are the people of colour? Did they not arrive and, until the, the, the time of empire? Absolutely not. So we need to look again at presence. We need to look at different stories in our curriculum and make sure that they are brought to life and they are discussed and um, championed. So this actually comes from the research research ed book on curriculum, which, again, I fully recommend. And what they talk about is the idea of the broader um, curriculum. So particularly those from BAME or disadvantaged backgrounds. So we're not just looking at middle upper class experiences that we're making sure that within our curriculum, we are looking at working class experiences as well. So if you're looking at kind of things like English, that it's not just your Jane Austen, it's not your Bronte sisters, you're actually looking at working class. And I know there are issues within literacy in English in terms of getting those perspectives of, of, of women and perhaps men of working class and, and, and you know people who came to England with English as another language. But we need to seek those out because actually what we've got is we've got this canon, this kind of fact or dominant discourse, and we need to shake that up a little bit, that traditional one. And we need to often look at what is being excluded and how that weaves into the whole narrative, because you can include those different narratives and say, you know, there were these voices, they were writing, but these were the constructs which prevented them from doing so. Let's have a little look at why, and is that similar to modern days and how can that be overcome? And so, for example, in history, it's not just enough learning about Britain in the Middle Ages and then suddenly learning about the development of um, the Atlantic slave trade. Well, actually, let's look at medieval Africa. Let's look at Benin and Mali and the amazing cultures and civilizations that were in existence before the arrival of, of the British in this kind of conquest. So in the past, history has been guilty of kind of medieval England. And then we look at the Atlantic slave trade and um, the movement of enslaved people um, from Africa to America and then the abolition of slavery. And that's given this false, false kind of history that kind of actually Britain went over there and civilized. And, you know, until then, there was no history in Africa and there was no kind of amazing architecture. That's absolute rubbish. There was such an incredible civilization. The architecture is amazing. The trade. Um, and there's so much that we need to kind of make sure that our children find out about so that we're not reinforcing these misconceptions that perhaps we um, experienced when we were going through the curriculum as children ourselves. And she talks about the importance of this as well within the chapter in terms of the belief that this has transformative potential for our students in doing this. By understanding how the world works, they also have a stake in it and they can see that the world is not something that's done to them. They are not just having the curriculum done to them but it's something that they are part of. They can see themselves within the curriculum. They can see LGBTQ, they can see um, women of color, they can see disabled people within their curriculum. And the goal is that they then want to contribute and they know that therefore they, they can kind of um, make sure that they are dismantling the master's house, which I think is such a wonderful phrase that she's captured from Audrey Lord as well. So the way that we change that curriculum, perhaps we experience, which was really quite narrow, is to get the children involved in it and make sure that it's representative. So I just wanted to make sure a few years ago that it wasn't just kind of me, that again, I wasn't just going down a certain agenda. And actually, when I did kind of a Twitter shout out, I found out that actually within history, there was this kind of over focus on, on kind of male history, because that's the curriculum that we were kind of shoehorned into delivering through kind of exam specifications and goes changes. And that actually we needed to make sure that it was much more representative because there were kind of lost voices within this. So it was interesting to see how nationally this was an issue. And I would argue if you're in international schools, it could be the same there as well. So if we have a look at um, what that kind of looks like is, well, actually, who, where are all these different women? Um, where are all these different people of different sexualities? Um, where are um, people of colour? You know, where are the Black Tudors? I bet none of us studied the Black Tudors. I bet none of us found out about Dr. James Binary. Uh, sorry, Dr. James Barry, who was um, trans, who was an amazing surgeon um, and delivered one of the first successful cesareans. I bet we didn't find out about the she wolves and female builders and Rosalind Franklin and all these other wonderful people. And so it's for us to go and find these stories and bring them to life for our children. Um, so 
this is something that I looked at um, and this was something that John Harmer came up with about how it is that we can make sure that we're not just kind of throwing it in and not looking at it in a meaningful way of how we can thread it in. So for example, in stage one, it might be the curriculum of the mainstream. So it might be that there is a curriculum and it's male centric and it fully ignores the experiences, voices and contributions of non-dominant individuals and groups. It could be that that's a curriculum that you experience or have experienced in the past. You could then maybe look at, well, am I in stage two, where we have things like heroes and heroines um, holidays. So we've just had, or still um, Black History Month. We've got um, Women's History Month. We've got all these different kind of like events where we suddenly bring to life these different stories and representations. And then it's kind of shelved the next year until that event comes back around again, where we celebrate this, but it's not threaded into the mainstream curriculum. It's kind of like an annual like and it's back sort of thing and then off it goes again we might argue that you were in stage three the integration where it is that you've got those threaded in and you are beginning to thread in elements of non-dominant groups to the curriculum so it might be that you know you have got people of color representative within your curriculum um but it, it's still not elevated to perhaps the stage uh, the, the level of stage four and five We've then got stage four, which is structural reform. So you're actually looking at the curriculum and you are purposely making sure that it is more complete and it's accurate. And you're making sure that you've got a range of different perspectives. You've got a range of different events and concepts and it's coming through from different lenses. So you've purposely looked at your curriculum, you've dismantled it and you've rebuilt it with that in mind. And then stage five is where actually the reform stage where within it you can talk about anti-racism, you can talk about sexism and economic injustice and it brings those debates to life. And I would argue that stage four and five is where we need to be um, or at least aim to be in the next few years. So moving on from that then, what I would recommend is perhaps doing an audit of your curriculum. So you might have something like a progression model or a curriculum roadmap, or you might have a spiral curriculum. So what I would do is I would do an audit of your curriculum. And that's exactly what I did. I wrote down kind of what we currently studied within our um, curriculum. And then I identified where the different links were across it, making sure that it was sequenced. And then I identified, well, actually, is it representative? because we've got slavery and empire, where is African culture? That should be in there. Tudor exploration at the start of the slave trade. Um, how about China and South America? That's not represented it. Where are these different things? Where are women? Where is um, all these different people that we could have included? And so it was about looking at it and thinking, actually, where have we missed those voices and experiences? And where can we make sure that we get those in? Is it too Westernized? Should we use books like Peter Frankopan and the Silk Roads? So what we did was we then created a new progression model and we made sure that we've woven those things in. So we've got things like Anglo-Poetan Wars, we've got Barbados, we've got the Silk Roads, including the Islamic world, which we didn't have in at all. So as well as medieval Europe, we've got medieval um, Middle East and the Islamic world. We've made sure that we're looking at different countries all throughout we've got medieval um benin within there and we've made sure that within topics such as first world war we've got africa we've got the middle east we've got the experiences of empire troops within areas such as the west indies we've made sure kind of within world war ii we've got the muslims of dunkirk um, and we've introduced a module which is the 60s social revolution looking at lgbtq second wave feminism and multiculturalism within britain there as well and what we've done is we've then gone through and made sure that we can see strands which go all the way through so i've mapped out exactly where it is that we kind of talk about kind of race and different cultures to make sure that we are looking at it in a broad stage four way potentially stage five and that we're not kind of stage two and stage three where we're just kind of dropping it in at random points and then moving on that actually we're threading it through meaningfully. So I'm going to skip over quite a few things because I'm aware that I'm looking at things uh, that I'm running out of time but some of the things that you can do is looking at scholarship so how it is that you can include kind of different reading um, um, from different kind of lenses different experiences so this is when we looked at the British West Indies Regiment so it might be that you look at kind of you know um, literature from other um, from other cultures and different countries. It might be within science that you give a research project about a scientist who's perhaps from China or from Vietnam. Um, so it's really kind of looking at how you can encourage them to look at different experiences. And again, I'll just move over this because I'm conscious that I'm running out of time. So um, 
One thing to look at is presence. So when you are giving them textbooks, when you are giving them worksheets, when you are showing things on your PowerPoint presentations, are you making sure that you are showing accurate presence and that you're not kind of giving them this kind of lens of, of kind of white men? So making sure that you're talking about presence, make sure you're including presence within the things that you are delivering within your content, but making sure as well that visually you are showing that actually it's not just white men who are around um, in your kind of subject discipline. So making sure that presence is recognized. It's things like looking at homework tests. So things like we've got these things um, which um, uh, Rich Kennett came up with, um, which is like, meanwhile, she. So if it is that you are studying kind of perhaps a male dominated or perhaps um, a white dominated kind of topic, you can give them homework tasks where it's meanwhile, she or meanwhile, and what we've got here is the Black Lions, the British Army were deployed to the Western Front. So thinking about how through homework tasks or research tasks, you can encourage them to look at different voices and lenses. And I find this is quite powerful as well with um, key stage four when it is that we are bound by a specification and we do worry about the amount of content we've got to go through. Let's look at this as hinterland. Let's look at this broadening of their kind of knowledge and exploration of the world by actually including these as homeworks, which actually strengthen their knowledge by exposing them to a, a greater range of experiences as well. But, you know, that kind of pressure of getting content in in time, this is a way that we can work with that. It's about kind of the scholarship that you're giving them. So extracts from your discipline, so from music, from maths, from science, from PE, that you're making sure that you're giving them text to read and strengthening that literacy and encouraging them to look at actual experiences of other people within that kind of particular topic that you are looking at. So if you're looking at something like, you know, IVF, are you looking at actually the range of different families that would use IVF and not just your kind of your heterosexual couples there as well? It's things like um, threading through within your curriculum into disciplinary aspects. So we had International Women's Day and every single department created kind of posters which they had on display. And this was really powerful because it showed that actually the presence of women throughout the whole of the curriculum, it wasn't just something that we were harping on about history and it brought to life all these different experiences. And what was so powerful about it was I actually didn't know about these two women in science and I teach the history of medicine and I now include these women in my teaching, I didn't know about them and the impact they had within my own subject discipline. And that has strengthened ties between history and science, which I think is a really, really powerful thing to do as well. So I'm gonna finish on this by just kind of suggesting some ways that you can broaden your curriculum. So for example, with music, it's looking at people like Dame Evelyn Glennie, who we know um, has um, hearing loss. And so looking at people of, of, of different kind of musical um, kind of talent that perhaps have different abilities and disabilities, it's about looking at the range of different music across the world. So global music and how we kind of experience that and the histories and the narratives behind it. It's about including things like indigenous music. So such as songscapes from native, um, sorry, indigenous people from America and First Nation within Canada. And looking at as well, the barriers that prevented women, people of color, different religions and people with disabilities how they challenged and overcame that, what continuing issues are there, is there still racism within music that needs tackling, how can we go about that? Within science as well, looking at people like Katherine Johnson, who featured in Hidden Figures, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who just completely, you know, um, trans, uh, helped to transform women, female GPs. We've got Alice Ball, Percy Julian, Tu Yo Yo, in terms of the antimalarial drugs, are they represented? Do you talk about STEMETs and BB STEM? Also within um, MFL, do images, names and narratives explore the diversity of French and French speaking countries? And I just picked French as an example. I know many people teach German and Mandarin and Spanish, but do they reflect the diversity of, um, you know, French speaking countries and their history? So what happened in Haiti and places like that in South America? Just a curriculum look at the contributions of the diverse population of French and French speaking countries. Does the curriculum focus too much on, on that kind of that country and not French speaking countries? And how is colonialism looked at? How is racism and attitudes towards women, including things such as femicide? Within English, is there a diverse canon being studied? For text by those such as the Bronte sisters, when showing images of the period, does it actually show people of colour, working class people and their different experiences? 
Do you use hinterland opportunities to explore how literature was evolving in other countries at that time? So you might be talking about, well, in England, in Yorkshire, this is what the Bronte sisters were doing. But meanwhile, in Indonesia, this is what people were kind of talking about. And meanwhile, in Mexico, this is what literature looked like at that time. Are you linking with history to look at barriers and issues in the past which meant limited opportunities for BAME, women including working class, LGBTQIA and people with disabilities? And when exploring texts such as Noughts and Crosses, talking about anti-racism and informing them of that. And within careers as well, avoiding stereotypes. So quite often within maths, it will be that an image of a female um, uh, Chinese girl will be shown and that reinforces stereotypes. And um, we need to be kind of mindful of that. We've got females promoting nursing. We've got older males as historians. How can we make sure that a broad strata of people are represented within these different um, areas? And for example, for my own subject, I know that the uptake of BAME communities of history is really, really quite small at university. And so we've got to change our curriculum to make sure that they see themselves within history. They see their own stories and narratives, and we can grow the presence of BAME um, historians um, nationally and internationally as well. And it's on us as history teachers to help them to, to start on that journey. So my next steps would be to do some wider reading and connect with peers, to work with your teams. You are the architect of a curriculum. What narratives and key elements do you think are essential to ensure a broad, diverse and balanced curriculum? And I know I've got history, but you know within your own curriculum. Audit your current scheme of learning. Look at topics with multiple lenses. So if it is that, say, for example, you've got um, a female dominated white kind of department, well, actually seek out the voices of others. Find those voices that they're, they're there to be heard and to be used and they should be included. Audit your current scheme of learning, but also be realistic with time and content. In the end, you know, the worst thing is, is and, and Professor Rob Coe says as well, change happens over time. It can't happen quickly. So your enthusiasm and your drive to make sure that your curriculum is diverse, don't rush it. Make sure that you take your time to think about who am I selecting? What is the connection? Does that flow within the sequence of my curriculum? Is that logical representation? You can't include every story and every narrative. So think about meaningfully who you've included and when there are people that you haven't included, make sure that you feel happy and secure about why you selected some over those because unfortunately we can't get everything in. Make sure that it's blended, not bolted on, and that you make sure that it's not separate. Maintaining individual experiences. So if it is, for example, you're looking at jazz and you've threaded women through without it, obviously don't you lose the individual stories of those women within there. You're threading it through, but you're also saying, you know, this woman experienced this, et cetera, et cetera. Use homework and independent learning to develop understanding. And then I've created this sheet, Digging Deeper, and I'm happy to share it. So this is something that we're going to build up in our school within different subjects, where it is actually when you are studying a topic within your curriculum, for example, World War One, or it might be kind of, um, you know, that you're looking at the development of um, knowledge of DNA within science. What are the different documentaries? What are the blogs and webs? What are the films? What are the books? What is the music? Looking at those interdisciplinary links that you can do there to broaden that knowledge of it and make sure that they are looking at things in a wider way. And that is me. Thank you, Thank Alex. You. That was really great really interesting and uh, very different so i think i liked it and people liked it there were lots of comments uh about different things they were talking and we don't have much time left so i'm gonna ask you just one question <clears throat> which i'm gonna post here so that everybody can see it's a question that richard asked that you talked a little bit about uh, you know uptake of history in university mm -hmm. but then do you think that making these changes making the curriculum more inclusive diverse all the way from primary would change the uptake in the CSC and A level as well. How do you follow through to know that that's happening or not happening? Yeah, so sorry, could you repeat that again? Oh, can you not see it? I put it on the screen. Oh, yes, um, so <laughs> yes, yes. So obviously, you know, we are educators, we continuously evaluate the curriculum. We are always going to be looking at kind of the impact of it, and that's what every educator does. I hate to say the O word, but intent, implementation and impact, you're always going to be looking at the impact because you've got to evaluate your curriculum and make the necessary tweaks in the end. The curriculum is organic. 
you've always got to reflect and think well, actually this didn't work and that didn't work and this is the intended impact that we had we came at it with the best intentions but actually this is the impact that we've actually seen and therefore we need to rethink and we need to reflect so what we have actually seen within our own department is we have actually increased our uptake at GCSE this has been our first iteration of our new curriculum and you know we were able for the first time to overtake geography it's not that we're uh, competitive um, but we have actually seen that positive impact there and we will continue to track that impact but also we will continue to make sure that our curriculum evolves as well as new stories and new narratives come to light and new sources because in the end we have a duty of care to the children and we've always got to measure the impact of our curriculum to make sure that it serves its purpose because we need to make sure that we are fair and serving them Yeah, that's great. <laughs> great answer. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, we don't have time for the other questions, but everybody, please type uh, tweet Alex. And okay. I'm sure she'll be very happy to answer any questions or anything else on Twitter directly. So that's her handle there. And also do the hashtag SenecaCPG so that the other participants can join in on the conversation as well. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you, everybody, for the comments Thanks. and the questions. So now uh, our next speaker is also Alex, but Alex Gordon now. Hi, Alex. Hi. Great. So uh, same thing, everybody, same drill. Ask a questions on the chat, share your comments on Twitter, and let's have another great talk right now. So thank you, Alex. Up to you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, now's the moment I'll try and share my screen as well. And there's that awkward pause while we wait for it to work. So fingers crossed this comes up quite quickly. Excellent. Um, now, thank you, Seneca, for, is that loading? Is, can you see that now? No, yes, perfect. Yeah, excellent. Well, um, firstly, thank you for inviting me to talk today. Um, my talk's entitled um, A Whole School Framework. Uh, and using a, a set of pedagogical principles for teaching and learning in a school. So um, my name's Alex Gordon. I'm the assistant principal uh, of teaching and learning at a school in North East London. Um, now, just a little bit about myself before I start, really. I've been teaching for six years. Um, I had an assistant um, kind of uh, pastoral role when I was sixth form. Um, and last year, I was a teaching and learning leader in the school. And this year, the assistant principal. So this kind of talk is a, a two-year journey, really, about what we've been going through in our school. Um, and some of the decisions and changes we've made uh, to try and prove our provision around teaching and learning. Um, now, when I was planning for this talk, I, I kind of just Googled um, a whole school framework. Um, and what you often find when you when you search that term is that in schools, we have frameworks already for safeguarding, uh, for assessment, uh, for mental health and, and well-being. Um, but generally, when it comes to teaching and learning, from my experience, what I've found, it's been kind of a whole school marking policy. Um, and this idea of what great teaching looks like in a school um, is something that maybe schools are, are starting to think about in the last year or two and trying to roll this out across their school and embed into their systems as well. And when I was appointed to this job, we were kind of going through a, a transition in our school around teaching and learning. And one of the first things I really wanted to do was to bring in place this idea of a whole school framework. So what does great teaching look like for us? What do we define as effective teaching? Now, the talk I'll go through today um, is not revolutionary. It's probably um, a lot of things that teaching and learning leads in schools are thinking about right now. Um, and I think it's a vital, a vitally important thing for all teachers to think about, really, uh, in support of evaluating their own practice and their own learning as well alongside that. Now, when we think about this idea of pedagogical principles, obviously, this will support the implementation of our curriculum uh, and what we're delivering in the classroom itself alongside that also. Um, so I think it's really, really important that these discussions are had within schools um, and that we have this idea of a shared language or a shared approach to teaching and learning as well. Um, now, my talk today is basically framed around three different areas. So I'm going to start off by talking about kind of why is this important? Why is this something that I'm really passionate about? Um, and why is a, a whole school framework of teaching and learning something that I think should be really, really important and should be used um, across schools, really? And why have I decided to implement that in our school as well? The second point we'll talk about is what did we put together? So for us, what do those pedagogical principles actually look like in practice? Um, and how did we share those with staff and how do we actually put them together as well? Because it's really important for me that I didn't put these together myself. 
Um, or as a leadership team, we put this together. It was a whole school collective buy-in in what we define to be great teaching. And then the third thing we're going to touch upon at the end is simply how has this been invented and how has this been embedded? Um, and alongside that, what is our potential future next steps with this principle? So how can we improve this in the future moving forward? So I really want to signpost kind of the direction of this presentation uh, and break it down through this why, what and how to kind of take you through our journey and take you through our thinking. But I think it's important to stress right now, this, this is kind of a journey for us. We've not finished. We're not at the end goal. Um, it's just kind of a, a route into our thinking and what we want to do in the future moving forward as well. Now, when I had this interview for the job last year, um, I read a really interesting blog and article from Louis Everett, who you might have seen on Twitter, um, who's a really strong proponent of this idea of a whole school framework for teacher learning as well. And it was a, a blog post that really kind of struck a chord with me. Um, and he talks about how um, a whole school framework for classroom systems, habits, routines, exits, entry routines as well, but also teaching and learning with a shared language is really, really vital for a school. And for me, what I really took from this quote um, is the idea of showing the rationale. Um, and I found it really powerful at school that whenever we implement a new idea or a new, a new suggestion, or more broadly, when we ask staff to do something that we want in within school, um, that this is shared by all, but that everyone understands the why as well. So why are we actually putting this into place? Why is this needed as opposed to just being a top down model of we should do this essentially? Um, so when I started this journey about putting together this framework, um, I really wanted staff buying. I really want to hear as many voice in discussions as possible um, to make sure that we're all on this journey together and we all knew the direction of travel and where this was going. Um, and this idea, I think, of consistency and a shared understanding um, is vitally important. Because not just from a leadership perspective, but as teachers, we all know the demands we have on our job, really. Um, and this idea, this balance between autonomy within a school, but work within a whole school framework, I think is really, really powerful as well and really, really important. Um, so I took a lot from this blog um, and I'd urge you to check this blog out um, if you get a chance to uh, see Louis on um, Twitter as well. because It's really, really powerful for me. Now, I just want to start then with, with the why is this really important? And I've tried to identify essentially just five areas or five key factors for why I think an idea of a, a teach learning framework that works hand in hand with the curriculum um, is really, really important. Now, the first one for me is this idea of clearing time and space. Now, we all can appreciate the uh, the hectic demands on our on our job on a day to day basis um, in school and how much staff have to think about uh, really from lesson to lesson. Um, and for me, when I moved kind of up into leadership, I thought it was really powerful to think about what it was like for a classroom teacher to have a five lesson day and to have a duty on top of that or to have an extra curricular club as well. Um, and so the idea of a framework for me gives staff something to fall back on. It's a scaffold behind them. Um, so they're not kind of left out on their own in some cases. They're starting to really think about and to support their practice as well. The second one for me, I think is really, really important. But it's around consistency across the classroom. Um, and the idea that students obviously have a number of lessons a day across a week um, and that in order to, to save time and to increase learning, to strengthen memory in the classroom for our activities um, and our retrieval practice, that there's a consistency from one classroom to the next. Um, and this will obviously improve routines and habits across the school, um, but also ensure that students don't have different lesson experiences. Um, and that's a really prompt start. There's a really clear routine and a really clear habit across our classrooms that staff are bought into and that staff are knowledgeable about, but also students very much are knowledgeable about as well. Um, so I think this idea of consistency and the same lesson experiences in most cases, um, I think is really, really powerful also. The third one is about removing obstacles. Um, and this is something that um, Sam Strickland talks a lot um, about. And I was kind of privileged to go and visit Dustin last Thursday, actually, and speak to him. Um, this idea of removing the fluff um, around teaching um, and empowering teachers to do what we do best, essentially, and that is to teach, to be those expert leaders in the classroom, um, teaching that subject material, checking for understanding and having those really rich discussions with students as well. So by having a framework that's streamlined, um, that's really clear, that's got that collective buy-in, uh, it means the idea of an obstacle is one less thing for teachers to not think about when they're in that classroom setting um, as well. And I think that's really, really important as leaders in what we do, we make lives as easy as possible for our members of staff to do what they do best, and that is to teach in the classroom. Um, now, the fourth one is something that a phrase that we use in school, actually, about our, our kind of our behaviour systems as well, but the idea that every minute counts 
um, and not wasting lesson time. Um, so ensuring that by having a whole school collective framework, and for example, by establishing that our lessons start with a retrieval activity or do now activity, that we are all on the same page, that when students walk into that classroom, they know what they can expect to see. They know how their lesson starts. Um, and it's not just a routine or habit from one teacher to the next. Um, and students got to think about 10, 12 different routines, different departments, but a general cross the whole school routine within this framework. So that lesson time is not wasted and we can really promote the idea of routines and get straight into the lesson itself um, to really improve their learning and the time we have with them. And last one is this idea of a cultural sense of collective responsibility um, so that we are all on this journey together, that we are all knowledgeable about the direction of travel the school is taking um, and that through every step of this process, whether when we start the process to the middle or the evaluation of quality assurance, that staff are all knowledgeable and are part of that process themselves. And um, it's not dictated to them uh, in some cases as well. So generally in summary, it's the idea that teachers feel they have this freedom within the classroom but they're also part of this whole school setting, this whole school framework that's there to support them in being the best teachers they can be in that classroom um, as well. And I suppose without this idea of a framework, um, there's no guarantee that teachers could be at their best every single lesson um, because there's this idea of a lack of consistency across classrooms in the school, really. Um, so I think teaching on a framework is really, really powerful. Um, and for me, they're, they're five of the key points and the key reasons attached to that. Um, now, when I talk to staff at school, I like to give kind of an analogy, really. Um, and for me, this picture kind of summarises the role I think I have and maybe potentially a lot of people have across the country as a teacher and learning lead. Um, I've used this analogy on Twitter before, but really I see myself as kind of um, the bridge in some cases between the wealth of research that exists, the blogs, the Twitter pages, the books that exist out there, um, that bridge between that and the classroom teacher uh, within school. Um, and we obviously know the, um, not the dangers, but the, the difficulties maybe some staff members may have in accessing research, thinking about the best bets of their practice. Um, and really, as, as Myra, I think, how can I make that as, as simplified and easy for our teachers to understand without undermining the subject um, specificity, really, um, but also without undermining their own practice and the time they actually have in the classroom as well? Um, and for me, having this idea of a whole school framework and thinking about what great teaching looks like for us um, is a, a really important way to share that research with them in a simplified manner as well. Um, and alongside that, really, in some cases, and, and I know this, uh, people might potentially may disagree with this kind of analogy, really. But um, as my role in a teaching and learning lead and the role we have of a teaching and learning council, which I'll come to speak about in a minute, in some cases, we are a little bit like politicians in school. Um, I know that's quite a, maybe a strong metaphor to use, really. Um, but I always thought about when I'm trying to bring a new idea or trying to get a sense of collective buy-in around the school, um, it's those kind of informal corridor conversations or those informal meetings or that kind of coffee cup conversation we have with staff members. Where we're trying to explain the rationale to them on an individual basis um, and then tweaking our plans based upon what staff members in our school say. And there's also always been that sense of um, kind of CPD sat in the hall describing this is our plan and then people go away and, uh, and do it. But there's a lack of that kind of subject um, kind of reference within that CPD. So having those kind of informal conversations, those informal chats within school um, to talk about ideas or talk about future plans, I think is really, really important um, as well. Um, and that rationale, I think, is vital when we think about a whole school framework and actually implementing what it might look like in practice. Now, this is a diagram that I shared with um, our staff members and our inset um, at the start of the year. And I'm sure you might have seen this um, before on Twitter. But by having a whole school framework and a set of pedagogical principles I'll come on to next, um, it's part of that drive to be as evidence informed as possible um, within our practice. Um, but obviously, I was very much aware when I presented this to staff, um, when you talk about research or evidence informed, it, it's quite a big word, quite a big concept. Um, and with the staff members, uh, the time staff have at school and at home, um, we're trying to move those barriers and those obstacles for them to really engage with that research. But alongside that, I think this diagram is really, really important about the idea of what can make a difference, what can be effective, what is the best bets within the research, um, but also adapting that to your own context. Um, and also the expertise and the professional judgments you have in a particular setting or your particular school as well. And I think this Venn diagram was really, really powerful, really. Um, and linked to what Alex said a minute ago, um, 
kind of promoting the idea that sharing research around the school is not a bolt on. It's not something just to throw to staff in an email or throw to staff in a CPD session. Um, but actually, it's part of this whole school framework. It's part of that journey moving forward. Um, and it's really going to help our practice um, and really have really beneficial effects on our curriculum, but also the outcomes um, as well as we move through that curriculum journey um, from key stage three to four and to five as well. Um, so I kind of feel like this is really, really important to set this teacher's learning framework within this idea of evidence informed practice um, as well. Um, now, before I get to kind of the next step in the how and what this looks like in reality, um, I read obviously Bruce Robertson's The Teaching Delusion, the first one when it came out a few years ago, um, and I found it really, really powerful. And it kind of um, gave me a kind of a little uh, shift in my mindset, really, about this idea of a teaching and learning framework. Um, and I'm currently working my way through the second and third teaching delusion book as well. But this quote just from the first book, um, and it talks about without a shared understanding, um, you might know what we are, you are trying to achieve, but you don't know how to essentially achieve it in school. And across the school, that idea of quality of teaching, the consistency might vary from lesson to lesson. Um, and for me, it was about having those really rich discussions about what does effective teaching actually look like in our setting and using the expertise we have around the, uh, the school to really have those discussions before putting together a framework that we all can use and we can buy into together. Um, so I found that kind of that book really, really powerful for anyone thinking about teaching and learning uh, or improving your practice as well. Um, now, how do we put this framework together? So what we did last year is that we put together a teach and learning council, which again is not something maybe is that revolutionary. Um, I know a number of schools have teach and learning groups um, as well, but I really wanted to, to work together with um, experienced leaders within our school to think about what could a set of pedagogical principles look like in our own context as well. Um, and when we kind of put this call out for people to join this teaching and learning council, um, we were very happy to see actually that across the council and the individuals we had really, um, we had a lot of people at different stages in their career. And that's just a rough overview there of just some of the people who were part of this council, whether from heads of department to deputy heads of department, to a classroom teachers, to our careers lead, and also an NQT in English as well. Um, so it's great to have kind of a rich, diverse sense of where people were in their experience and their journey, and also hearing their voices with our discussions as well. We followed this kind of five step plan, this five step model to put in together what we defined as great teaching principles in, in our context. So we started off our first meeting looking at, well, why are we doing this? What's the purpose? What's the relevance in our setting for putting this framework together as well? We then looked at the research and, and had discussions around that. And essentially, within our, our early meetings, really, and I know a lot of them would have been remote because obviously we're in lockdown, it was about sharing the research base, sending this out to people in the group, um, ensuring we're all reading it and we're having those discussions about, well, we could use this part, we could use this part, how does this link to our own context and what we want to do as well. Um, and that was kind of a big, heavy part of that um, those meetings as well, exploring the research. Then we looked at the idea of creation. So we said, now we've looked at the research and established what is out there and what um, has been written. Um, what should this look like in our own practice? What do we need to include within our principles? And equally, what do we not need to include? What should the principles not be, um, essentially? Then the fourth step was the idea of design. So once we established, well, this is our principles, these are the components we're going to follow, well, what does that look like? Would it be in a poster format? How are we going to share that with staff? Um, how are we going to break it down to simple steps? that people can understand. And then the fifth step was we'll gain feedback from the staff body and we'll gain um, ideas in, during a kind of consultation period and then we'll launch that as well. Um, and for us really, it was quite nice because the calendar fit really well about we put these together at the end of last year and we're very conscious that we didn't want to launch it in the middle of um, kind of mini assessments and the teacher assess grades in the summer. But we want to have that fresh kind of start that next year we're going to have this set of framework and um, we want everyone to be on the same page and we had that consultation period that was really successful as well. The only real requirement we had for people on this council was that um, we wanted the willingness to lead, to learn, and teachers who are enthusiastic and committed to kind of this cause, really. So there was no kind of interview process. It was open to as many people as possible. But we did set kind of a, some characteristics we were hoping to see from people that wanted to, to be part of this council. And equally, some of the wider responsibilities were for people on the council. Um, they contributed to QA. Um, they delivered CPD in a number of different settings as well. Um, were part of kind of whole school action plans moving forward. 
Um, and also we got the memberships to the Chartered College of Teaching as well um, to access more research um, and their courses through that as well. Um, so it's kind of a really powerful set of meetings and discussion um, before we establish what the principles maybe would look like. Um, now, these are the three questions we discussed about kind of our, our second and third meeting when we start to think more broadly about what should the principles really be. Um, so we kind of had this shared kind of document on our, on our staff system about what must be included, what must we see within these principles. Then we had another question about what would you like to see? And then the third one was actually what shouldn't be included? So what are potential dangers or pitfalls about rolling out this set of pedagogical principles um, as well? Um, and the responses were really, really interesting. I just want to share with you the responses we had about what shouldn't be included um, as well. And we kind of factored these directly into the principles themselves when we put them together. Um, but staff and the people in the council were very much strong about um, the expectation should not hold staff accountable. They should not be prescriptive or burdensome to the practice or the way um, quality assurance is run within the school. Um, they shouldn't impinge upon different subjects as well. Um, alongside that, they should be that set of principles that underpin our practice as well. Um, they should be based around evidence and research is the idea of best bets. But also we should be really conscious that these are principles. These aren't activities within the classroom, um, but it's a set of principles we would expect to see in different classrooms in our school. But obviously we didn't expect to see all of them in one lesson um, as well. So it was really interesting to think about what shouldn't be included alongside what should be included as well. So seeing it in two different settings um, alongside that. So what we came up with really um, is this kind of document. So this post us, this is the what um, part of the presentation now. Um, and we defined it into eight different components, which is driven by the research, collaboration, and the experience we had uh, within the staff as well. Um, and this went through a number of tweaks and consultation period, and this is what we ended up with um, for our pedagogical principles. Um, so we very strongly argued that um, true autonomy within the classroom lies within this idea of a framework or this scaffold for staff members to fall back on as well. And we thought it was really important, really vital that uh, the words we use in this principle become part of a shared language. Um, and we're actually training staff in the language we'd like to see them using within discussions they have within the school as well. So this is what we kind of collectively identified as our principles. Um, I know a number of different settings or areas have um, other ways of um, kind of characterizing it as well, but these are the eight components that we use within our school. Um, and when we kind of launch this to staff, we were so conscious and strong that we said that these aren't prescriptive, these aren't a checklist. We wouldn't come into lessons and tick off whether these principles are being met. Um, but these, this is what we define as great teaching. We, we maybe can't expect to see all eight of these in a lesson, but these are something that's really important for us to think about kind of in our own setting as well. And to make it kind of even easier for staff to understand in some cases, we put together a, a guidance prompt sheet where we kind of turned each principle um, into a set of questions for staff to kind of self-reflect on their own practice, for departments to think about as well, um, and for them to think about, uh, this is what it kind of means in reality. This is what we're expecting to see related to these principles as well. Um, so these were set at the end of last year, um, and these principles are currently being embedded within the school um, at the moment as well. Um, and moving forward, we're very conscious that these principles will be tweaked and maybe adapted as we keep moving within our curriculum journey um, down the line as well. Um, now, the next step in our process then was how are we going to embed this? We've got this, this document we've put together, staff have seen it, there's been a consultation period. Um, how are we going to ensure we share that research base and we train staff about this terminology um, and we give them practical suggestions what this looks like in practice? Um, so what we've done this year is have these kind of eight principles um, and we've kind of blended them together and across obviously the, the six week, uh, sorry, this the six half terms across the year, um, we've given each half term a focus based upon the principle. Um, so autumn one we've just uh, gone through is around retrieval and retention. Um, and the idea is that each half term, one of these principles would be the key core focus within our meeting structures and within our CPD as well. Um, and that's the avenue or the vehicle for us to share the research we want to with, uh, with staff um, and share the strategies that we think are, are beneficial. Now, again, we're very, very conscious that this wasn't a top down model of us saying, here's the principle we're focusing on, here's the ideas. And within our CPD structure, we are driven by staff members. Uh, we are driven by the expertise we have in the school for sharing best practice um, alongside that as well. And some of the ways we kind of are, are using these principles and embed them to practice can be found in this diagram um, here. Um, so within our meeting structures, we commit um, to having department CPD twice a half term 
um, for departments to meet together. Um, we use these principles very heavily in subject leads meetings as well. Um, in terms of sharing best practice and teaching and learning tips, we base them around the principles for that half-term focus as well. Um, one of our CPD's opportunities is called the Expert Panel CPD, where staff members present based upon the principle an idea their views of in school um, across that half term as well. Um, so within our meeting structures, we're very, very um, conscious that these principles within a half term play a central role in what we do uh, for professional development in that half term as well. Um, now, this year, we try to kind of streamline and map out a meeting structure for each half term so staff are knowledgeable and aware at any point in a half term and any week, what might our CPD look like? Um, so for us, week one within a, a, a half term is around communicating the focus for that half term based around the pedagogical principles. Um, and that comes about not just through, this is our principles, here's our poster. It comes about where um, I put together a one page research document based around that principle, which I'll go through on the next slide as well. Week two is always our subject leads meetings. Uh, where obviously we focus on the three eyes and the offset framework, but also we base part of that meeting around what is the principal focus for that half term. Week three um, is around subject knowledge and ped pedagogical um, department CPD. Um, and this is an idea I got from kind of Jay Pierce on, on Twitter, who's a um, brilliant when it comes to teaching and learning. Um, and that CPD is based around what the focus is for that half term also. Week four is then our expert panel CPD event, where we invite staff members to present their best practice and share their ideas based around that half term principle and that focus. And then we finished uh, the half term again on department meetings as a reflection for what's been learnt and shared and gained in that half term kind of block, really. So we try and focus much of our CPD and meeting time within one half term on what the principal focus is for that half term itself. So staff are aware of what's coming next. Now, this is an example of a one page research guide. So in week one, we share this with staff. Um, and in a pre-recorded video, we will say um, our focus this half term is retrieval and retention, the first component within our principles. Um, and then we share this kind of really small, really quick research document with staff. Um, and for me, I think this is a really strong and really good way of um, condensing the research into one small document. I try never to go uh, beyond two pages, really. Um, and we share this with staff in the first week for them to think about and for them to read through and how this impacts their practice. Um, and this is the example here of this, uh, the half term coming up um, around person sequencing and high expectations and communication. So our second and our third component as well. At the bottom of these research documents, you'll notice there's kind of a, a little bit of writing, which I kind of try and use for a lot of our um, communication with staff. I try and make this prominent in a lot of our documents or small research guides about we're on this journey to promoting a research informed approach based around these principles. Um, and for me, this is a really powerful way of sharing research with staff in a small and simplified manner um, that doesn't take them too long to read, but also gets to the crux of our approach to be a research informed school um, alongside that as well. Um, and these documents I've shared on Twitter as well, if anyone's interested in um, adapting them or using them for themselves. Now, once these documents are shared, uh, I share a quick kind of form with staff in that first week where once they've looked at that research summary and once they've heard the pre-recorded video, I just want a few reflections from staff about what their understanding of that principle is in that half term and what their key takeaways are. And for me, question four is vitally important because when we have that CPD expert panel event where staff present around that principle and their ideas, obviously, I want to get a sense of which staff in the school we can use and utilise. So we use a Microsoft form to try and um, ask for volunteers in some cases to present around that strategy and around that idea. And this form is the same for each half term. So staff get used to layout and what we expect from them. Um, I usually then share a document like this within our bulletin of just some of the key findings or answers that staff gave to that form. So I kind of summarize really some of the key things we get um, for the first and second question. Um, and I share that with staff and say, actually, this is our whole understands of school of this principle. These are our takeaways that we've established and we can read each other's work and really share ideas through that use of that form um, alongside that as well. Um, now, coming back to the curriculum, really, and this is something we've started to implement this year. Now, a number of schools have done this as well um, and they might already have it existing. But this idea of a curriculum handbook um, as a really important way to share in the research around the curriculum to defining key terms within the curriculum. Um, but also it's an avenue for us to ensure that our curriculum vision and our principles as we've just gone through 
are clearly signposted and clearly um, accessible within the documentation we share of our leaders. Um, and within the kind of the fifth part there, it says our school curriculum vision and principles. So we're actually promoting and sharing our curriculum principles through this idea of a handbook um, as well. And I think that's really, really important. Now, at the start of this journey, when we launched this to departments, we asked departments to do a bit of self-evaluation um, around where they currently saw themselves within those eight um, components, um, kind of a small rag racing exercise within our department meetings. Um, and for me, when I was thinking about our different departments and the strengths and areas for development, um, I kind of used this kind of audit and self-evaluation tool to think about um, which departments feel like they're strong in different areas and which departments could I really go to to discuss ideas of best practice and to ask those teachers to present a whole school setting as well. Um, this kind of audit we kind of will be doing across the year at different points as we work our way through each principal each half term um, to really see how departments have engaged with the research, spoken about the things we've spoken about within our CPD in a whole school setting um, and start to implement strategies and ideas to move them towards a green kind of rag rating alongside that as well. And this directly links into our quality assurance as well throughout the year uh, to be supportive and developmental to staff to really ensure they understand this framework. Uh, and also that they're active in this self-reflection evaluation throughout the year as well. Now, our CPD kind of expert panel events, as I said, takes place in week four. Um, and the one last half time, we had six presenters. Um, and I like to kind of put together a poster or kind of a corporate branded um, poster, which really um, kind of sells the, 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 the events, but also makes kind of staff feel um, quite proud and special in some cases about their presenting the whole school setting. It's a really important event for staff to share ideas. Um, and within that, we have kind of a se session title and the left hand side, just some slides that staff shared around what they did around retrieval and retention. Um, so it's not just coming from me saying, here's a research document to listen to and to read. Actually, staff members in the school are presenting. This is how I use my ideas in the classroom based around this principle. And I think it's really, really powerful. And these expert panel events are, are great to listen to staff talking um, about their own practice. And I try and make them um, as, as, as much cross curricular as possible and use as many departments as we can um, to share this idea of best practice. Some of the discussions and questions we have in this event it is really, really rich as well. Now, um, just to finish, really, just kind of two kind of little changes I've tried to make this year of teaching and learning, different ideas that schools might do this already. But um, outside my office this year, I've got a teaching learning notice board. And in that notice board, uh, we make it really obvious and visual and clear around what our half term focus actually is. So it says they're retrieving retention. So when staff are walking down the staff corridor, this idea of visibility, I think, is really, really important. Um, so staff are always made aware of this is our focus for this half term. Um, this is our CPD. These are events we're going to be doing. And alongside that, the idea of a teach and learning CPD library um, that easily accessible within the school. Um, now, this is the formation, the early start of this library. We've not kind of rolled it out to, to look a lot better, like you see on Twitter and some other schools and examples. But within that, I try and characterize and frame. Um, these are the, the books for this half term based around this principle. These are the areas that we go to to help support staff to select some reading alongside that as well. Um, but we found this idea of CPD library vitally important as well. Um, now, just to kind of kind of summarise really towards the end, um, within our kind of CPD approach this year, this interconnected curriculum, we try and make sure that those principles are, are really prominent throughout different strands we follow, especially the whole school strand, kind of strand one. So everything we do this year in terms of CPD, we're trying to make these principles um, really prominent, underpinning the meetings we have and the different kind of pathways we follow. Uh, within school as well, um, which obviously supports the idea of embedding these principles within our school culture as well. Now, before I kind of finish, really, um, I just want to think about areas to be careful of, because um, I know we talk about teaching and framework, there might be some dangers or pitfalls attached to that um, as well. If you're on this journey, have completed this journey, or are starting this journey yourself as well, really. Um, now, the first one, which I mentioned before, which might come to mind straight away when we talk about a framework, is about undermining what subjects are doing and not being prescriptive and saying, these are our principles, this is what we expect in your lessons at all times, this is how we would want you to teach. Um, now, obviously, as leadership, we, we can't tell those subject experts to teach. I'm a history teacher, I can't walk into a history classroom and tell an art teacher, this is how I want you to teach. Um, so we make, have to make sure that these principles underpin what we're doing as a school, but they're not prescriptive in telling subjects exactly how things need to be done. Secondly, this idea that we're all in together, we're all collective on this journey, and it's not being imposed from the top down, but we're all bought into this. 
And for me, that's really important as we put those principles together and we started to launch it, that staff were on board with what we were doing as well. The third one for me about embedding, embedding and embedding. Uh, and that's something we're obviously thinking about a lot this year, about making sure it's always prominent, always visible in what we do, really. Um, and one small example of that is that obviously within interviews for a new job, often the first question you ask interviews is how did your lesson go in within you just taught an interview? Um, changing that language around, well, why did you plan that lesson in that way? What was your thinking about starting with a retrieval practice? Why did you model at that particular point? And really kind of getting teachers to really think about the principles and the research base and think about the idea of why something is taking place in that classroom. Fourth is the idea of space. So we're given space for departments to discuss and talk with each other around what these principles mean like mean for their own practice. So in history, this principle looks like this, but allowing staff to think about that and have those spaces in their meetings to discuss. And the last one is kind of that, um, that phrase around a framework liberates and supports autonomy. And it's really kind of getting that across to staff that um, we think it's so important that autonomy shines through in a framework. It gives you something to fall back on. It gives you a scaffold. It gives us an idea of a shared language within the school that all of us can discuss and talk about as well. So kind of getting that through to staff um, alongside that also. Now, this is not the end of the journey. And we know very much we're at the start of this journey for, for a whole school teacher learning framework. And moving forward, we're thinking about how we can take this to the next level with um, linking this to our idea of professional growth and performance management in the school um, and really getting staff to think about those individual principles um, and also at some point down the line thinking about staff doing sort of research projects based around one of those principles to really support and share more best practice within the school alongside that as well so this is something that we are extremely passionate about moving forward um, and something that we've just started um, but we're really passionate about the fact it's going to have a real impact in teach low our school moving forward as well okay and i think that's my time there hi yes uh thank you so much that was really great uh very interesting lots of positive and interested comments and also questions here we have time for one question i was going to ask you something that was coming up a lot by different people in the beginning which was how do you make sure that that's not a top-down approach how you're not imposing yeah. like removing teachers individuality but i think you cover that then during your talk so yeah. let's go for usma's question which was when you were talking about all the cpg events that you do yeah. and it was a little bit about workload and how do you balance time if you include so many meetings and all of that so that's his question there for your question yeah i agree and, uh, I suppose some of the dangers, something that I was thinking about um, within when I started this principle is that it, it does seem quite a lot on paper. Um, and also I'm, I'm a very big friend of simplicity and really being clear with staff about priorities and our focus. Um, for me, I kind of see this year as once this is embedded, and it's within the staff culture and the shared language for next year. And the rationale has been explained clearly. Um, we can then move forward the next steps and kind of simplify the approach even further. So it's about that embedding process within it as well. Um, what we've tried to do to support staff with CPD is that we did a, a survey at the start of the year thinking about to lockdown last year and some of the real positives and benefits that shone through during lockdown that supported staff in their CPD journey. And obviously one of the, the biggest things that shone through is the idea of pre-recording CPD so staff can watch it any time um, during that week potentially as well. Um, and using forms as a, as a, a recap kind of mechanism, um, not just having a face-to-face -face meeting, asking staff questions in that moment. Um, so very much at different points in the year, we try and ensure that meetings aren't there for the sake of it, really. Um, and we're quite flexible with how we use inset days as well um, as a way to support staff with their time and their workload as well. Um, but equally, we think the, the most powerful discussions um, that staff can have are in those department meetings with similar practitioners of their subject as well. And we really give as much time as we possibly can to those department meetings so we discuss and digest their views alongside that as well. But if a meeting isn't needed, we won't put it on kind of thing as well. So we're very much supportive of um, staff views and um, we're very open to that feedback um, as we go throughout the year as well. Yep, that sounds great. Uh, I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, thank you so much, Alex. We really only had time for one question, but That's please fine. everybody, uh, I noticed that you typed your handle wrong on your slides. You forgot the mister. So can I'll you just tell I'll people? Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just repeat your handle, how people can get in touch with you. Because there were other questions. I just don't have time to ask them. No? Yeah, it's just Mr. A.W. Gordon underscore. That's the handle, yeah. Yeah, OK, brilliant. So thank you so much. Oh, let me remove that question here. 
Okay, thank you, Alex. Thank you, no problem. So now uh, we're gonna go for a five minute break, everybody, because we're already a bit over time. So just five minutes, just, you know, loo and tea, and then we will get back for Zoe's talk. So please be here on time. Just before you go, uh, there's something that I should have said in the beginning, but I forgot. We have a newsletter. Wait, wrong one. We have a newsletter. It's called Head Start, and it has lots of different articles written by lots of incredible educators. It's free to subscribe, and you receive all the articles directly in your inbox. So this is the... I lost here. So just look for senecalearning.substack.com and you'll find it, subscribe, and you start getting. And we're going to share all of the slides and PDFs and everything from the speakers via the newsletter. So if you sign up, subscribe for free, then you're going to get everything on your email directly. So that's a good tip. And also the other tip is to like this video so that you can always find it later. It's going to be saved on your own YouTube account. So then you can always get back to it and watch it again or share with your colleagues who couldn't be here live today. Cool. So it's 10.57 now. We're going to go for a five-minute break and be back at 11.02, please, just so we don't run now, run out of time, basically. Yeah. Okay, see you in five minutes.
Okay. Uh, 11.02. Sorry for the quick break, but we really have to get going. So, uh, Zoe, are you ready for your talk now? Hello, can you all see me? Yes, fantastic. Okay, great. So no. now we're going to go for Zoe's talk. And again, same thing, questions, Twitter, everything else. You already know how to work on this conference. So thank you, Zoe. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Flavia. Um, lovely to see everyone here today. Um, I hope you're enjoying being part of the discussion. Um, certainly these presentations have got lots for us to think about and lots for us to consider. And uh, that's really where I'm kind of coming in, this, this idea of, well, what can we learn from some of the experiences we've had around building curriculums for our students and what might we take away? Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Zoe Ensa, and you can follow me as Grebo Runner on Twitter, and I'd definitely be happy to carry on lots of conversations with you there. But um, I'm currently working across schools in Kent uh, for the education people, um, supporting them with various things, including uh, their English curriculum um, and also other aspects of work in schools. Um, but perhaps most importantly, I spent um, over 20 years working in schools myself um, as a head of English, an English teacher and a senior leader. And uh, this has really prompted my interest around the idea of CPD and particularly the idea of curriculum. So I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully the right one's going to come up. There we go. OK, because that really got me thinking about this idea of the CPD curriculum and what it might mean that we need to do when we're thinking about our staff learning and not just our students learning. Because, you know, I was really excited with the fact that um, there have been a real change over the last few years and thinking about our curriculum and thinking about, well, actually, not just, you know, let's go through these various aspects um, of, of learning for our students. Let's really think deeply about what we mean by the curriculum. And that's exactly what I've been hearing going on this morning, this really deep thinking about the curriculum for our students, thinking about things like inclusivity, thinking about the methods and approaches that we want teachers to be using in order to do that. And so... Having sadly, I, I will have to say, sat through um, an awful lot of situations where I didn't feel that the learning that I was going through, where I was in an inset or as in a, in a twilight, was actually having much of an impact for me as a teacher. Um, you know, I, I'd really become disconnected with CPD. So I wanted to think about, well, how can we perhaps reinvigorate things, how can we change things, and how can we make sure it has an impact? And that's really what it's all about, isn't it? It's having the impact for our students. And we know that having great teachers in our classroom is exactly what we need to do. That you know, There's a wealth of research out there looking at things like the Great Teaching Toolkit, um, looking at research from people like um, David Slater and Burgess, and, and they really unpick this idea that it's the great teachers in the classroom that absolutely have the most impact for our students for their outcomes. And by outcomes, we mean outcomes in those broadest sense, not only exam results, but, but it it's really makes a difference closely followed by leadership. So thinking about all of those things and why it matters, that really did lead me to this idea of CPD. And, and, you know, I have to say, again, I was a little disappointed to read the research that Curie did in 2014, where they were looking at the impact of CPD in the classroom. So there was me sitting there and thinking, well, I'm not quite sure how this learning is going to make a difference to what's going on with my students in my classroom. And then I read the Curie research and it said that there was less than 1% of the learning and the CPD that was going on that was seen to be having an impact on the outcomes of students. And that's really quite worrying. If we know that having great teachers is what makes the difference, and we know that the CPD that we're delivering to people, that we're spending a huge amount of time on, that we're investing a huge amount of money into, is not actually having the desired impact, is not necessarily creating lots and lots of even better teaching and learning in the classroom, then I think we've got a problem. So again, that brought me back to this idea, well, what do we need to do in order to address that? 
and I started thinking about this idea of curriculum and uh, hearing what Alex was just saying about some of his approaches in his school, it's clear that there are these some kind of common threads that are coming through in relation to that. So I wanted to take you through today a little bit more about how that works and how we can bring these two things and these two ideas together about what we do when we're thinking about curriculum for students and then what do we do when we're thinking about curriculum for our staff. So here's kind of a very basic uh, framework of what we do when we start to plan our curriculum. It's really important that we know the destination. We know where we want our students to end up. Um, we've got perhaps a framework. We've got those different points of GCSE or A-levels or SATs or various other externally uh, verified outcomes for our students but we also might have broader destination goals for our students as well like things like um, being a more independent learner or, or, or developing confidence around this particular subject so we have that destination in mind but that's only part of the picture because it's also really important when we're designing our curriculum for our students to really think about the starting points they're at. So the knowledge that they have, the experiences that they've got, what their schemas have been developed like to, to start off with, um, and them as both individuals and um, along the lines of them as groups. So we really unpick that starting point. We think about the destination. This is our curriculum. We know the word curriculum comes from that, that uh, kind of Latin of journey or, or race or course. So we then plan our route and we think really carefully about the sequence that we want our students to go through. And we think about our pedagogical choices. So what is going to be the most appropriate way that we can deliver that information to our students? So we've got the what we're going to be delivering and we've thought about the sequence. And then we really carefully think about how. And those kind of curriculum decisions happen on that really kind of macro level where we think about that perhaps uh, as a school or a department um, and then we think about that very much as an individual and so we plan that route really carefully though when we're thinking about our students and we keep some of those decisions quite live so again we are adapting but we make sure that we really do know what it is that that route will look like allow for some deviation and that is how we kind of take that next step in our curriculum. But in order to make sure we don't go too far off track, we think again about the milestones. We think about what's the key knowledge that's going to be needed along the way. What are those students going to have to be able to do at that particular point in order to take those next steps? So again, we're constantly thinking in that plan, where will those milestones be? And we will take opportunities to look in their work. We'll take opportunities to talk to the students about the learning and really reflect on that deeply. And that brings us down to that kind of assessment and, and really good assessment, high quality granular diagnostic assessment will help us to know, is our curriculum having that desired impact? These are all things that you're very clear on when you're planning for your students. And then constantly as you reflect, you'll be visiting those points and you are building on them and rebuilding some of those things. Well, you're probably not going to be that surprised to hear that when we're thinking about our curriculum for staff, well, actually, it's very much the same really here. We need to know, again, our destination. We need to know what it is we want to achieve when we're working on a curriculum for staff. So what would we expect the teaching to look like? And most importantly, how does that relate to the learning that's going on? I said at the start about that, um, that rather saddening figure from the Curie report, where it says that it's that less than 1% having a transformative impact. So we need to know what it is we're trying to develop, what it is we're trying to change. And that's perhaps harder when we're talking about teaching and learning, because um, as Alex mentioned just a few moments ago, um, there aren't these absolutes, there are best bets. And he's been working really hard to build up those best bets and to think about those kind of uh, what are those best bets in teaching. But we don't have the absolutes. We don't have, well, if you do this, then that is guaranteed that your students are going to have better outcomes. And that's why we're constantly looking for evidence and exploring the research and thinking about that. But you need to, and you're planning your curriculum for staff, 
to understand what your destination will look like for you with your students. So what is it that you need your staff to be able to be doing and working on and exploring in order to make the difference? And then again, I think this is even more complex. It's that identifying the starting point of your staff. That is, a, is, is quite difficult when we're dealing with students and we're constantly thinking about, well, how do we diagnose? How do we find out exactly um, what their, their knowledge is and make sure that that's secure before we move on? But with staff, we've got an even wider group with an, an even greater um, kind of di differential, I suppose, in their understanding, their experience, the subjects they're working in, the phases they're working in. Even when we think about ourselves, we've got areas that we're really confident in and we've been using that knowledge and practicing that particular element for a number of years in some cases. And we've got other people who it, it, it's quite new. That doesn't mean that they haven't got a lot of knowledge and they haven't already got schemas that are well developed around these ideas on teaching and learning and ideas about their subject. So identifying staff starting point is going to be kind of your, your greatest um, differentiation uh, obstacle, perhaps, uh, if you're thinking about it. So what you really need to do, and again, I heard Alex talking about this, is that dialogue, that discussion, really talking to people, taking um, the evidence from a range of different places, exploring that. What is it that you're seeing is happening in the classroom, in students' books? But all the time, it's that discussion and it's that dialogue. You need to really carefully plan your route, just as the same with, with students. But how often do we think about the pedagogy for the adults? that we're working with, particularly if we're leading it. How often do we think about ourselves as learners as well? I know that was quite a revelation to me when I started to consider myself uh, much more as a learner. And I thought about, well, what is it that's the most effective learning for me? So therefore, what is the most effective learning for those people I might be leading and, and working with? So thinking about, you know, is it actually everybody sitting in the hall for an hour after school where we go through a variety of PowerPoint slides? Or is it something else? Is it a different approach? I'm quite a fan of um, the David Kolb experiential learning cycle, which he wrote about in 1984. He was looking particularly at, um, at again, adult learners training in particular. And um, he was thinking, well, what is it that actually brings about a change in practice? And that's ultimately what we're talking about. We want to change people's understanding. We want to change people's everyday practices. And that's really difficult sometimes with teachers because they've got really well embedded practices day by day that have become habits that are quite difficult to disrupt. So the David Kolb cycle um, it really, you know, you can start at any point, but starting off with some theory, starting off with some information, giving teachers some new knowledge that might perhaps disrupt some of their earlier knowledge or build on some of their earlier knowledge. Then they need the time to think about that, reflect on it and contextualise it. Context is really important when we're thinking about building our curriculum for staff, staff getting them to perhaps change and develop their practices or think about their practices. It's what's kind of relevant to the context is so important there. So giving them the opportunity to think about it and reflect on that knowledge. Then Cole suggests that what we have to do next is to have that opportunity to explore it and experience it in practice. We need to have those two things. So it isn't just about kind of the theory and the abstract and the knowledge. It's about how we do something with that. And actually, that's not, again, that dissimilar to when we're talking about students. It's all very well that, you know, we've read Jane Eyre, but what are they going to do with that information from it? But that day by day, step by step practice for teachers who are in that part in the classroom, that's really important. And then they can come back and reflect further on the theory and the knowledge to think about how they've developed it and make further adjustments. So that's just one particular approach to the pedagogy that you could use. But I would suggest that really thinking about what's going to work for our staff at this time is incredibly important. Just as with students, then we need to think about the milestones. 
what is it that we're going to be looking for at different points now that won't be the big picture that won't be everything but you need to start gathering that information and i would suggest that just as with developing a curriculum for students you need to think about this at the starting point so what are we going to see after we've done this particular piece of cpd or this part of the program what are we going to see in two weeks time what are we going to see in a month's time? Where are we going to see that? Is that going to be through dialogue with teachers? Is that going to be through looking at students' books and exploring those? Is it going to be some other aspect that we want to consider? But what are the milestones, the checking points to make sure that we haven't gone completely off track and to bring people back to the theory and the idea to have fidelity around what we want to achieve? And then that kind of further assessment. And it is really important with those milestones that we are assessing all the way along. We wouldn't want to be saying to students, OK, right, you're going to be doing um, GCSE history. Uh, I will tell you how you're doing at the end of the two years. Of course, we would. But all too frequently, we might do something at the beginning of a term and uh, or at the beginning of, of the year. We have these inset days with fantastic plans and lots of good things happening. And then it's the assessment of that happens next time you have a performance management observation. Now, I would always urge people to separate out staff development and performance management or appraisal systems anyway. But very often that's been the way that we've worked or we assess it against the student's outcome. So you did a course from um, the, one of the exam boards way, way back in um, June of last year. What impact has that had on the students at the end of next year? Well, actually, it's it's not likely to, to have had much of an impact if you haven't had that regular opportunity to think about it. So how are you actually assessing it? What's realistic? What's reasonable? I would suggest as part of that assessment, it needs to be in dialogue with teachers and then just as the same, revisit and rebuild. Now, um, I've just had a slight realisation that I actually think that this is a, an older presentation that I've popped up here rather than my latest incarnation. So I will just talk through this next point. But when you do get the slides, if you, if you are signing up for that, you will get a little bit more information of this. Because I think the whole part of, of this part of curriculum development for both staff and students, it has to be underpinned by a culture and the right culture. We want to create the right culture for our students. We want to make sure that they're in an environment where they can learn, where they can be focused, where they can attend, where they can make progress where they know that they will be supported to make that progress and where they know actually sometimes it's going to be okay to fail. And I suppose my big question is, do we always ensure we've got that right environment for learning for staff? Ideally, absolutely, yes. You know, we, we know that we want to do that because we think about staff well-being and we think about how they are feeling in that working environment. But actually, is it an environment where they can learn and feel supported to learn? Have we created an environment where there's mutual trust? Have we created an environment where there is an opportunity for them to have open dialogue? Do they feel that their input is valued? Um, I, I think um, that, that Helen Timperley's report uh, from 2015, she did a review of uh, effective professional dialogue um, and, and professional discussions. And that point about, you know, does everybody feel that they've got a valid um, viewpoint to put on the table is one of that key, those key enablers. If we've got staff knowing that they can be really open, if we've got staff knowing that they can also challenge each other in a supportive way, then we're creating the right conditions for them to be able to develop and for them to be able to learn. Um, we know that we want to be challenged. We're professionals. Of course, we want challenge, but it's got to be that appropriate challenge. And it's got to be all the time, I think, linked back to um, the outcomes for students. I'm yet to meet a teacher who's gone into the profession at any phase of any kind of subject who aren't saying, well, actually, what I really want is I want things to be better for my students. I want their various outcomes to be as good as they can be. And so Therefore, we should already be in, in a good position to have that challenge because that's what people want. As long as we're really focused on that, then that's that's what's important. 
But people need to feel that sometimes they can make mistakes because we can learn a lot when people have, when people can be open about that, then we are again in that really strong position to to unpick and explore and think about how we can develop it. So I would say creating that environment for, for the adults to learn, for the adults to be open um, to treat everything that um, that is put on the table as a hypothesis of equal value with problem solving as opposed to just saying to people well, you've got to do it this way and I think this is where that shift between the top-down approach and um, and that kind of grassroots approach where teachers are coming and saying actually I want to explore this okay I know as a school we're focused in the, on this area because you know, we know that's going to have the outcomes for our students. But actually within that, I want to really examine what difference this might make. And if I've got staff coming to me excited and saying, you know, that this is fantastic, I want to be able to, to do this, I want to look at this, then I know that we're getting the culture right. I know that we're kind of developing a situation where people feel that they want to grow and they want to develop. And then that brings out all that kind of positive side of well-being as well. If people have got a purpose and a focus and they feel valued and they feel supported, where can we go wrong? But we need to think about that as we're developing our curriculum. What are we asking for people? And is it the right time in order to be able to ask them to do that because we haven't quite got the conditions right? Sometimes it's worth pausing and reflecting and building that before we start to move into just delivery that's part of the implementation that i think is important are we in the right place in order to do this yet and then with everything we do in education we need to make sure that we're really thinking about reviewing we need to choose carefully and select carefully there is a huge amount out there that we could uh, select from in terms of uh, evidence in terms of research but actually, you know, we've only got those best bets that I mentioned earlier. So careful selection related to, to what we want to do should be what informs our curriculum and what informs our actions. Using things like the Great Teaching Toolkit, going to the EEF and seeing what some of those best bets are. Really unpicking what does it mean for your context, again, should be part of your curriculum development. And then after we, as we're acting, we think about that measurement, what have we achieved, and we review it. So I'm kind of keeping a very close eye on the time because I do want some time for questions as well. But um, just to come back to that point about really assessing in order to be able to create the right curriculum and to build that right curriculum. Um, coming back to perhaps some of my more negative experiences of sitting in the hall and thinking, I'm not sure how this CPD relates to my classroom. I'm not sure what I'm going to be able to do with this. And I'm not going to have any time to do that. That's really important as well. It was because I sat again and again and again through the same kind of session on being an effective questioner. Now, the feedback I was getting on my teaching all the time was actually your questioning is a real strength. Your questioning is something you're doing well. Yes, okay, there are always tweaks, but you probably don't need the basic, you know, here's how to do questioning 101 kind of course. And yet there I was sitting year on year on year and doing that and feeling increasingly frustrated. And I think this quote from David Usabel, the American psychologist about the most important single factor influencing learning that's going to happen is making sure sure we understand what that learner already knows and then teaching accordingly I think this is absolutely the case for teachers not just students so again you know thinking back at those starting points considering the steps that will need to be taken depending on that and actually sometimes accepting that well this group of teachers or this individual will perhaps need a different approach at this time. We need to perhaps not go down the route where we're going one size fits all. Um, uh, Chris Moyes, uh, who I have an awful lot of respect around growing uh, great teachers, um, he talks about, it, you know, it, it's one size fits one. 
And I think this is the point of, the, of this idea that we need to really know the staff. We need to have those dialogues. We need to have that conversation. It's not all about assessing by going into classrooms and observing or checking student work. It's actually about really knowing our staff, knowing what they know and then building on that. So uh, hopefully, um, I'm not going to be sitting um, here in 10 years time and hearing that actually Curie have done some more research and in their research, uh, they've found out that less than 1% of the CPT that's being delivered is having an impact on the classroom. I think that there is a real um, tide, a real change. The fact that people um, are giving up their time on a Saturday because they want to hear more and they want to learn more and they want to develop their own practice. I think it's a really exciting time and one that I've really seen kind of move forward in the last couple of years. But having that curriculum, having that understanding, both on a, a whole school level or on a team level, or even yourself as an individual, thinking about my own progress and my own curriculum and building that as an individual was an important step for me too. So I'm hoping you found this uh, discussion useful. Um, apologies that um, my slides will be slightly different to ones that you may well later see. The principles are the same, just the organisation is slightly different. And uh, I'd be really excited to hear if there are any questions that you'd like to talk to me about. Hi Zoe. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Yeah, don't worry about the slides. We can send them the updated version <laughs> later on. I realized part of the way through, actually, that isn't my last set of slides. That yeah, I that, that's not a problem at all. <laughs> it was still an excellent talk. Just threw um, me ever so slightly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we do have a few questions. So I'm going to put them here. So there was a question by Mark uh, in terms of matching or creating coherence can you see the screen can you see the question yeah between yeah. the curriculum for the staff and the curriculum for the student oh that's an interesting one um I'm, i suppose the, the, the points of entry there would be in relation to uh, subject knowledge or specific phase knowledge and it's those points and so if i were developing a curriculum for my um english teachers then in my kind of department, I'd be thinking very much about, well, what is it in terms of the subject knowledge that they that the students need to develop, that the staff then need to develop. So that, that would be the points that I suppose if we saw them as two parallel lines, they would that that'd be the points where they would be touching. Um, I don't know, I think I think I'd have to explore that one. That's a really interesting one to have an overall coherence between the staff and students. I'm not sure. Every, everything needs to come back to student outcomes. That, that's ultimately the point. There's no point us, you know, spending a huge amount of time, um, our own time or other people's time, unless it comes back to the outcomes for students. So, and, and as I said, those outcomes can be broad. So I suppose that would be that coherence between them. But yeah, I, I've not heard it framed like that. So that's an interesting one that I'll need to chew over a little bit, I think. That's fine. That's a great, that's already a great answer. And that's the point of conferences, right? We always kind of creating new ideas yeah. together. Um, so uh, from Julia, it was a comment, but I changed it into a question. Mm -hmm. So she was talking about how the different CPD curriculum has to adapt to school's individual needs and context and where the school is, what kind of students they have. So what would be the main point to keep in mind when you are creating the CPD curriculum to make sure that it follows your school's context? Yeah, I think that's that tight but loose um, that Dylan William talks about, um, which I think people adopted quite quickly, but didn't necessarily unpick very much. But he talks about this uh, tight but loose approach. So you've got to have that real understanding of, uh, of the key principles of what you want to be able to achieve. And once you've got that really deep understanding uh, and that framework that is going to kind of fit around everything, um, Alistair Hamill, who wrote in my book, a, a lovely idea of, of kind of the, the journey of the river and the, the weaving together of the paths. So I think that, that's the same kind of idea. So we've got the structure, but then within it, you can allow that level of personalization. I think that individual context, giving people that, that space, as long as they've got fidelity to the core principle, 
they can explore that further. They can decide what it is in terms of, you know, metacognition that they want to look at for their students and in their classroom. And I think they need to still have that support around it. I think they still need to be able to have that conversation around it and, um, and maybe some scaffolding. But I think it comes back to that expert and novice. An expert is going to have a wealth of information. They're going to have these huge schemas. And what they don't want to be done is kind of buttoned down and, and told, you've got to do it this way. That might not be the right approach for them. But giving them the time and space within that structure making sure you've got the fidelity to the core principles would be the way that, that I would be going. Yeah, that sounds great. And I think that matters as well uh, with what Alex was talking about, about not being a top-down approach and mm. the whole community of teachers working yeah. together. We um, want that kind of safety of, of the framework, we, uh, but then we've got to have that agency within it. But with that, if it's total autonomy, we could be leading to total chaos and we're back to people might be investing huge amounts of yeah. they're only working on something but it's not having that desired impact that we want for our students yeah that is true uh so that was 30 minutes so we need to move on to the next one but thank you so much that was excellent uh please let people know how to get in touch with you because there were I other am. questions sorry don't have time for all of them no please please do i'm Grebo runner um you can also find me as zoe Enza, um on twitter so uh, i really look forward to carrying on that conversation thank you very much for listening um and uh, hopefully speak to you soon yes thank you so much bye all the best okay so now we're going for our next and final talk which is by Lekha Sharma. uh she yeah that's it so i'm gonna put her twitter handle as well on the bottom so feel free to type questions for her on twitter later on unfortunately she had a family emergency so she cannot be here live but she recorded the presentation last week so i'm gonna play the presentation for you and she said please send me questions on twitter so please do she won't be able to answer them live here but do get in touch with her because she's waiting for your questions on twitter Okay, so let me uh, play, if I remember how to play your video, just sorry, yeah, there, okay. Hi everyone, my name is Leika Sharma and I'm really, really happy to be one of the speakers at today's Seneca conference. Can you just please, before we continue, could you hear her speaking? Please, just to make sure that the video is working. Just type yes yeah, if you could hear her at the beginning. Hi, everyone. My name is Leika Sharma, and I'm really, really happy to be one of the speakers at today's Seneca conference on curriculum, the big picture. So let's get stuck in. And I always like starting conversations about curriculum, thinking about what a curriculum is and what it isn't. I think it's really important that we have a shared understanding of the language that we're using around curriculum. Um, and so based on my experiences of curriculum design and delivery in schools, um, I really feel that the curriculum is what your school stands for. So the foundations on which a school is built upon and the learning journey that a pupil embarks on from the minute they join you, encompassing all of the different experiences and opportunities that you will provide pupils with along the way. For me, what it isn't is a piece of paper, a one size fits all approach confined to senior leaders or even subject leaders and surface level. So it runs really, really deep within and throughout the school. And so again, we talk about uh, sequencing our curriculum and having really coherent curriculum. Uh, again, considering what that actually means and what that looks like. So why is carefully sequenced curriculum important anyway? And I like to think of the analogy of uh, providing a pupil with a book um, with lots of pages ripped out of the middle and then asking them to recount the story. So of course, pupils might be able to give you a really superficial level um, recount of the story, maybe mention some characters and a general kind of plot line, but they won't necessarily have the deep understanding that we want them to. And um, just like this, I think it's really important that we're structuring curriculum in a way that we're really building on strong foundations of what's gone before. 
Um, and I'm going to be talking about some practical examples of that too. And so one practical example um, of, of this and, and a tool that could potentially be useful in helping us uh, sequence learning in our schools is this idea of learning ladders. Very simple concept of thinking about what we're teaching our pupils and the knowledge that we're teaching, but also considering what's gone before, what's coming next, and more importantly, thinking about the foundational learning. So in this example here, you can see year five studying to use a range of conjunctions to extend their ideas in a writing lesson. But actually, without the foundational understanding of what a sentence is, how a sentence is created and the component parts of a sentence, it's going to become very challenging for that pupil to engage with that age related material. So um, I guess this kind of concept can be really useful in terms of a planning tool for teachers, but also to be explicitly shared with pupils so that we are taking every single pupil along with us in our lessons. Um, and also just considering, I guess, that big picture thinking of curriculum and how that translates to the actual classroom. Um, and I like this visual here. It's related to social media, actually, and thinking about the curated and the uncurated self. But I think it actually has relevance to curriculum, too, because we can have really um, great, shiny, snazzy curriculum documentation. But if they're not being if the curriculum is not being enacted and brought to life in the classroom, um, it really does become somewhat inconsequential. Um, and so actually bringing that big picture curriculum thinking closer together with the pedagogy and teaching and learning and what happens in our classrooms day to day. Um, I think can be a really powerful way of still having that overview of the importance of curriculum, but considering how it's actually translated and how it impacts pupils day to day. Um, and previously in, in roles where I've led CPD within a school um, and supported teachers in their development, I've used this idea of having a teaching and learning toolkit. So providing teachers with this toolkit of strategies that are rooted in cognitive principles uh, about how we learn and rooted in our best bets and what we know about, um, you know, our developing understanding of what we know about what works well in the classroom and then providing teachers with that a uh, sense of you know autonomy and professional judgment where they can draw on this toolkit as and when needed when they feel they need a particular strategy they're confidently able to employ it and thinking about how professional development ties into the development and establishing this kind of teaching and learning toolkit and one of the things that i would argue is a really big part of that toolkit and one of the you know one of the strongest tools a teacher has is this uh, strategy surrounding making big ideas digestible. Uh, and you can see this quote here from Albert Einstein that if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And I think there's a few things we can do to ensure that we are making those big ideas and concepts uh, digestible and we are breaking them down for our pupils. So one of those things is intellectual preparation subject knowledge for our teachers and actually providing and carving out the time and space for our teachers to be able to develop that subject knowledge um, so that they can deliver it in a way that's most effective. And I'm sure as teachers, we've all been in the situation where it's a last minute dash to Google to find out what we're teaching tomorrow or find out a little bit more. And actually, we all know that deep down that doesn't quite sit right. And we know that we don't know the material well enough to be able to securely break it down for our pupils. So actually providing teachers with that time and space to do that, I think, can be quite powerful. Sequencing learning, I think, is crucial to this idea of making big ideas digestible, considering the prior knowledge. And I guess this goes back to the ideas of learning ladders. Um, so considering the learning that's gone before, what's yet to come and how we can incrementally build in complexity of knowledge um, and cumulative knowledge building. Um, and again, coming back to that idea of teachers exercising their professional judgment when actually navigating that sequence of learning. And so this kind of takes me to the idea of, and I've kind of broadly covered both things there, the big picture of curriculum, and then talked a little bit about pedagogy. But this idea of having an overview of your curriculum, I think can be really useful in parallel with considering the day to day teaching and learning that goes on in the classroom. So you consider this picture here or the one that I've just shared now, 
Um, this is a picture, a beautiful picture of planet Earth uh, taken from International Space Station. And I just want you to take a second to have a look at the picture and think about how significant your choice of what you're wearing today or where you're sat today or what you had for breakfast feels in light of having a look at this picture. So just take a look. And I recently did this kind of thought experiment with colleagues at, at Research Head in Surrey um, and had some really wonderful uh, feedback from, from colleagues that they were sharing that it made them feel like there's a bigger picture, that there's something uh, larger at play, um, that, perhaps, that perhaps the little decisions aren't as significant as we uh, sometimes feel that they are. Um, and I guess that idea is the overview effect and it's essentially a really fascinating phenomenon where astronauts in space who who view the earth as a whole uh, get a very similar sensational feeling uh, so nicole stott she spent 104 days in space she talked about it being a feeling of interconnectivity that you sometimes just don't get when you're in the middle of something i think separating ourselves from things that are important to us is good because you then appreciate it in a new way and that definitely happened for me with earth chris hadfield who spent 166 days in space said you start to see the world exactly as it is our collective shared room we almost all miss that because we're only able to absorb the confines of the part of which we're raised with and i think it's a really interesting concept that does have um relevance i guess when we're thinking about curriculum and the big picture because it's almost like we need to keep this eye on you know the detail and you know the day-to-day -day and the teaching and learning and the very small decisions we're making in the classroom but at the same time almost like parallel train tracks running we have to have this overview effect this step back where we can really consider the big picture of our curriculum and it kind of is rooted in um, the idea here of the process of education by Jerome Bruner. Um, he talks about the more fundamental or basic is the idea he has learned, almost by definition, the greater will be its breadth of applicability to new problems. Subjects rewritten and their teaching materials revamped in such a way that the pervading and powerful ideas and attitudes relating to them are given a central role. So this idea that we are capturing within our curriculum, those pervading and powerful ideas, which is our what and our mapping of the curriculum and what we are teaching and how it's sequenced, but also we're keeping that really keen eye on how it's being delivered in the classroom so that we know that actually that knowledge that we intend our pupils to acquire, they actually are acquiring during their time with us. And um, I guess now kind of moving seamlessly between big picture and the day to day, but coming back to this idea of curriculum uh, Kaizen. Now curriculum Kaizen comes from, uh, is, is kind of a, an application of the idea of Kaizen, which is a Japanese philosophy around continual improvement. So Kai meaning change, Zen meaning, meaning good. Um, this concept has previously been applied to the car manufacturing industry, and the idea is basically that everyone comes together and feeds back on curriculum, makes small incremental changes that strengthens curriculum over time. So those who are enacting the curriculum on the ground are able to offer these insights that can shape, refine and strengthen the curriculum as you move forward and as it refines, you know, across a year, across academic years. Um, so really thinking about that idea of refining curriculum um, across a period of time. And again, um, as I mentioned, um, it's been used in the car industry to really streamline manufacturing processes and make them the best they can be, but also to um, to lead to the best outcome in terms of the end product. So actually considering how this idea of Kaizen could help us as leadership teams, as staff teams, as colleagues to come together and really consider how effective our curriculum is, where there are opportunities, for example, for more connectedness, what we're learning from delivering the curriculum. 
And um, this idea is also really consistent with um, this uh, small increments, small incremental change and progress. And if you haven't uh, read this book here, Will It Make the Boat Go Faster by Ben Hunt Davis and Harriet Beveridge, um, I would highly recommend it. It's not actually education related, but it's about the um, Sydney uh, 2000 Olympics and the rowing team that went to went and got gold um, in the Sydney Olympics. But actually, it was more about the question they would ask at every single turn, which was, will it make the boat go faster? Um, <clears throat> so everything down to the paint that they decided to use on the oars, they would always come back to that question, will it make the boat go faster? Um, a really great book that a, a colleague recommended um, to me a while back, and I love it because it talks about basically cutting the noise, coming back to that core purpose um, and really considering your curriculum and, and what it is we intend for our curriculum to achieve for our pupils um, and thinking about will it come back, you know, will it make the boat go faster? Will it will it achieve those goals? Um, and considering moving almost seam seamlessly between our purpose and the tasks that we do day to day. Um, so, you know, it, a really interesting opportunity that I've had is the opportunity to be able to be, um, I guess, on both sides. So designing a curriculum bespoke for a school and then getting into the classroom and actually implementing that curriculum to stress test and, and learn lessons from it. Um, and that really offered, offered me the opportunity to have that big picture, but also then drill back down into what um, enacting that curriculum looked like. So, um, it, you know, we, we had designed this curriculum, it was rooted in the evidence, it was bespoke to the, to the school and the community that we were serving. Um, and then to go and actually deliver it in class in, in a living, breathing classroom. Um, and we, you know, we did this for a year. And then we came together and we asked ourselves some questions. Is the curriculum meeting the values and philosophies of our curriculum offer? Is there sufficient connectedness? Is there coherence, for example, in the science curriculum? And is there coherence across lessons? So reflecting and taking that step back so that we were able to identify the strengths and areas of development for our curriculum. And just a picture here of um, my year six classroom and um, thankfully my, my uh, principal at the time, you know, allowed me to go back into the classroom as a, a vice principal, be a full-time teacher in year six and actually enact this curriculum um, and a really, really formative experience uh, with lots of really um, useful insights and reflections. And I think also enabled me to um, strengthen my curriculum leadership um, skills because I was able to do the do in the classroom. I was able to talk about our curriculum with colleagues, but also reflect on the realities of um, what the curriculum looked like day to day in a classroom. And just some lovely uh, pictures here, lovely memories of teaching in uh, year six, some of the wonderful outcomes from pupils um, and me waddling around the classroom quite heavily pregnant at that time. And so that idea of curriculum Kaizen, um, I think is, is really well demonstrated by this idea of the feedback loop, which is illustrated in chapter five of Making Every Lesson Count, a really excellent book around teaching and learning. Um, and it essentially talks about feedback between pupils and the, te uh, and the teacher. And I think this idea can really nicely be applied to curriculum. So what are the outcomes? What is teacher pedagogy, pupil voice, cross-curricular connectedness? What is that telling us about our curriculum? And how can we use this information year on year, not to radically change the curriculum, but actually just to make those small tweaks to strengthen it? Because we still want to maintain the integrity of our curriculum, um, whilst being able to make those, those incremental um, changes. And so for us, that looked a little bit like this. So an annual curriculum review. So thinking about what the outcomes and performance of pupils told us about uh, what the most effective delivery methods were um, and really encapsulating great teaching and learning. So this worked really, really well. 
Um, why did it work so well? Let's unpick and unpack that together. Thinking about incremental improvements over time, those small tweaks. And I cannot stress that enough because schools are very busy places. Leaders are busy, teachers are busy, uh, support staff are busy. And actually it's about making those small changes that we know will have the biggest impact on our pupils. Um, and so part of that was uh, identifying these benchmarks of brilliance and, you know, what does excellence tangibly look like in terms of learning materials, approaches that we've used, pupil engagement and interaction and pupil outcomes, and actually using and keeping those things as artifacts of really great curriculum uh, enactment so that we could share and disseminate that best practice year on year. And I think it's important to note that although I'm sharing these ideas and making it sound mega easy, um, there's lots of complex complexities involved in this. Um, and this idea of the GI Joe fallacy by Santos and Gendler in 2014 um, is that idea of, and it comes from a cartoon that, that it was around in the 1980s, where at the end of every cartoon, uh, G.I. Joe would say, and now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Um, and actually, it turns out that it's not half the battle. Uh, simply knowing something isn't enough to be able for, for us uh, to be able to immediately go out there and enact it. So again, just reiterating that idea of providing our colleagues and teachers with the space and opportunity to practice, to reflect, to share, to disseminate best practice and to disseminate where it's gone horribly wrong so that we can take the learning from that forward um, in service of, of providing our pupils with a really great uh, learning experience. And again, a reminder that although we sometimes might see, think that this should be more the top line, A to B, school improvement often looks like the line underneath, very complex, lots of different things that we don't see coming, lots of challenges, but also opportunities um, that shape our curriculum journeys and understanding the, the uniqueness of every school's curriculum, uh, individual curriculum journey. Um, and just, you know, bringing to mind Dylan William here, who talks about the importance of context. Um, and he says, you know, in education, what works is not the right question because everything works somewhere and nothing works everywhere. So what's interesting and what's important in education is under what conditions does this work? And I think that's a really nice reflective question uh, for individual schools, contexts and settings to be considering um, as they navigate their curriculum journey. Of course, leadership and culture underpins all of this work and, um, you know, the association between teacher leadership and student achievement. There's lots of research that um, shows that association and, and that strong association. Um, I've also seen this during the rounds um, on Twitter, which is you can't put students first if you put your teachers last. And I think that's a really nice, simplistic way of looking at it. Um, so thinking about the um, I guess the things that are involved in mobilizing really effective curriculum um, and it being really underpinned by the culture in a school um, and how and how teachers and, and colleagues are led. And I think it's really important to note that, you know, one doesn't have to come at the cost of the other. So great outcomes and, and a broad, rich curriculum can help come hand in hand. Curriculum consistency and teacher autonomy. Um, you know, there's a balance to be had there and it's a complex issue, but actually, um, you know, it's it's worth it's a really worthy endeavor for us to be looking at how we can find that balance and strike that balance. Um, and again, with academic development and personal character development, um, you know, one definitely does not have to come at the cost of another. Um, and all the while, I guess, maintaining our why when it's, you know, looking at the big picture of curriculum or when it's looking at the the detail, um, you know, coming back to this idea of why are we doing this? What is our purpose? And are we fulfilling that purpose um, and maintaining that throughout our curriculum work? Um, here are a selection of books that have been incredibly influential in my thinking about curriculum. Um, and uh, you are more than, you know, please do go read these and check them out. And um, you're more than welcome to contact me on Twitter. I'd love to hear your reflections after reading um, some of this stuff because it, there's some brilliant stuff out there on curriculum development and design. Um, also outside of the field of education that could really influence and shape curriculum thinking. 
Um, and that there is my book, Curriculum to Classroom, which you can get on Amazon and from Waterstones. And it's essentially the journey of designing a curriculum from scratch, bespoke to a school and introducing it and implementing it. Um, a really digestible handbook that I hope will, will help and support colleagues in their work. Uh, thank you very much for um, listening and sharing in my thinking. Uh, please do get in touch with me at Teach Future 2. I would love to hear from you. Feedback, reflections, debate, um, more than welcome. And please do enjoy the rest of today's wonderful conference. All right. Thank you, Leka. <laughs> Uh, for recording and thank you all for joining. So this is the end of our conference. Please, please do go on Twitter and thank. I saw lots of thank yous and comments still going on. Uh, for you, those of you who are still delayed, please go on Twitter. The speakers will love to answer any questions or just hear your thoughts and your comments about what they shared. So please go on Twitter and then us also at Seneca Learn and me. I am Flavia Bellion, PhD. So please get in touch with everybody and we'll love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining. I wish you all an excellent half term break, lots of rest, and we'll keep in touch. Bye.